Hello, everybody. Welcome to this short little version of NPR. Um, unfortunately, uh, Nick, he's, get, he's getting work done, and we're supposed to do this. All right, let me let me start back. Okay, so yep. uh, it's been a pretty much a hell for me for like the past week um, because oh, let's see where do I start? So we can get this out of the way so that you understand when podcasts are late and stuff. So I passed out at work. Oh. <laughs> and um I don't know what it was from. My blood oxygen dipped way down. My heart uh the heart beat went way down. It's getting old, right, Owen? Yeah, um, you just you just died and fell over. That's what happened. Is you just yeah. Met- yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <sighs> so there there's that. Um and then um What's that? He's getting worked up. <laughs> you said that and Justin latched right onto it. <laughs> it's just, yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, so, so there was that. And then I pulled my, so Nick was originally supposed to come on, on Monday and we were supposed to not do it live and we were just going to do a show and then it would come out on Tuesday, just like NPR usually does. But however, <laughs> I pulled my, after being sick for, uh, you know, a day or two and, uh, they say it's long COVID. I don't know. I got to go get more tests done. I'm not really sure what the deal is. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, we're sorry about carpets and coffee. Um, it was just Lucas and I, and we couldn't reach Eric because, you know, he was unconscious. And um, we, so I had to just quickly sign in to the one program I had access to, and we did a carpets and coffee. And about five minutes in, Lucas is like, you're in the wrong program. You know that, right? It's like, oh, Oh yeah. So um that audio will be released soon. Um that's just well, that just shows you that you can't 12 years worth of <laughs> not paying attention. It's, if it's I'm gone, you guys are in me. trouble. So we've that's all talked, the more, better, this the more of the times. reasons <laughs> that if you're gone, my, the show's uh, over. Yeah. The thing that upsets me is um the thing that upsets me is is that uh you know I, for the last like since january i've been trying i've been working out i've been trying to eat right and it's just like i just like one <laughs> headache after another so i pulled my back out i've never done that before i didn't even do anything i just picked up my new puppy and apparently mm-hmm. that was enough to trigger me into not being able to move for a day so we had to postpone <laughs> to it today but nick was worried about they're doing he just sent a message so um he knows i'm not that he thinks I'm lying, that he's lying or something, but they're doing work in his area, Xfinity network, something, mm. and they're not going to be done until later tonight. So he was worried about that. I said that, yeah, you know, let's see how it goes, but we're going to move into tomorrow night. Um, I'm sorry. I know everybody's excited. I'm excited too. We had a lot of cool stuff to talk to Nick about. We haven't talked to Nick just carpet pythons in a long time. So, you um, know, everybody go back and think of more questions and we'll meet back here tomorrow. You know, done. Because uh, I thought I gave that to you. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I'll me or you Lucas? <laughs> well, no, no, me, no. You, uh, you have millions of times. I, I just don't ever write it down. Lucas, maybe. Well, yeah, I know you. I know you. Yeah, I know you. Maybe uh, I'll make sure you have it, Lucas. So then you do it. But anyway, that's why the the podcasts are a bit off the of sink and stuff like that. And um, and then my mom actually went into the hospital too. She had to get water drained out of her lung. It's just been a fucked up week, man. Jesus. Anyway, man. all that being said, <clears throat> um. We're going to have Nick tomorrow. We were going to do me and Owen, but you don't want to hear us. And I don't want to hear us either. I want to talk to Nick. <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't want to hear us. I don't want to hear us. Nobody wants to hear us. Moving on. Oh, okay. <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on. Don't push. It might be no. back up and running. I don't know. No. God, this is reminiscent of the old days. Yeah, this is blog talk days, man. Yeah, like, this is like, yeah, we're, we're pushing we, buttons and hoping. I typed it in the chat, but it was like nobody believed, me. nobody, like, I thought that the response would be different when I typed it, that Nick might not be coming. Mm. Uh, I'm just, uh, this is the, hey, this is, is what, Carpet this Fest is. happening this year. Yes, in August. Yes. yes. In August. We, we, we haven't, we haven't thing. figured out like when in August, but it's in August. Yeah. Just just everybody clear your calendars for the entire month. 
So, and then, you know, we'll be ready to go. But uh, that is the idea. I believe we're trying to avoid shows like Daytona and um, other things. So we will be definitely having Carpet Fest. I just have to nail down exact dates. We're trying to make sure that it's not. Um, yeah, you, I mean, do you, you you have to attend, Lucas. You no, you you don't have a choice. Everybody else is invited. You don't have a choice. Look, uh, I blame Lucas for all of this because he was supposed to aid Nick in all things technical. So this is definitely going to fall back downhill onto the intern um, and uh, justice will be served. So, yep. Where would it be? You know what? Hold on one second. I'm going to. Yeah. I'm going to. Push gonna, buttons. Um, He's going to mute himself and leave me here. <laughs> what an ass. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he's going to do that. But it's going to be at Eric's house in um, Warminster, Pennsylvania. So that's what we're planning on so far. But not the first one. The Wookie thing's already there. Hello, people. Uh, Luke, they can't be at Lucas's uh, apartment. Well, if he wants to run a Northwest out of there, that's fine too. We can do that. So that's weird. Those two books say different about that, but okay. Hi, everybody. I guess I'm just hanging out with you right now while Eric tries to get Nick on uh, and he leaves me to rot. Like, it, this is a very reminiscent of the old days when he would just bow out because of technical issues and. I'd have to try to just uh, fly by the seat of my pants because he does have all the questions and everything else that would go through. So I do a trivia contest. <laughs> you can do a trivia contest if you want. It just seems how it goes. But we will get more information out to you guys as we kind of hammer out the details. So no, you don't. No, no, no. It, um, Carpet Fest has outgrown my house so fast. And uh, I mean, technically, we probably shouldn't have even had it at my house the second year. It just got way too big, way too quick. So sorry to Eric leave you like that. Back. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> sorry sort to of leave you like that. Um, I think we're still going to go for tomorrow because he. Do we really want to get going and have another issue? I, I'd rather. Yeah, the problem is, is tonight he has a hard out. Yeah, no. and I have a lot of stuff that I want to talk to him about, and I don't want to. Um, I don't know. I don't. I don't want to uh, to cut it short with him, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And Owen's got some stuff that he could do tonight if he postpone if we do the show tomorrow that he was supposed it's to. It's called do cleaning. Tomorrow. It's called cleaning all the various serpents in my house. Um, that only is two a day. Good lord! Uh, first off, this is phase one of the week just where we do where we do the cleaning, and then tomorrow oh, we do the waters, stages. and then and then uh, there's 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 very various spot cleaning throughout the rest of the week. Come now, sir. We should probably talk about that. What cleaning? It sucks, but you got to do it because you know you're the only one who can. <laughs> like they're your animals, and you got to do it. If only this were a vote. Uh, not a democracy. He's good for the full time seven and nine. Cool. All right. Seven to nine works. So we just had sort of a, a cut this part out. Yeah, I would cut everything out. Just just burn this. Don't don't <laughs> let this see the light of day. Ne never again. <laughs> In fact, never play this again. So we're doing it tomorrow. Yes, we will be here tomorrow, Wait. seven o'clock. Hold on. Wait, waiting <laughs> or I, not. I, I, I'm not kidding. So I, <laughs> he, I said, I, my, my fear is, is that it would be cut short. And he's like, I'm good for the full time seven to nine. And I said, then jump in then. And he hasn't answered me back. 
No, tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> it's seven to nine tomorrow. Okay. All right. Leverage. All right. Please. We will be back tomorrow. What a Thank you. total catastrophe. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the thing. Oh, wait, no. He is there. What I on the you? actual. Fo- <laughs> 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 Swear to God. <laughs> oh. There he is. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, oh. Sorry to everybody that left. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> So Lucas said he was trying. <laughs> Lucas is supposed to train you on these things. Yeah, Nick, I blame he's... Lucas. For all of I don't this. know. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't think this one was your fault, though. No, no, you had, this you is told a... everybody. It's usually my fault, but that doesn't <laughs> like... <laughs> it's usually I'm so old. I'm like not very technically. I'm very technically challenged. So I've been back here for ten minutes screwing around with this camera and green screen, trying to get things lined up. Even that's befuddled me in my old age <laughs> well you know i feel your pain man i feel your even, pain <laughs> even that mostly just to camouflage how messy my office is so nobody can see what's behind the mess behind the, the green curtain. <laughs> oh that's how you do that okay that's a disaster oh. yeah this desk is a mess. okay all right well i guess we're doing this right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Eric, ask um, questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So do, do yeah, before show, we Eric. get into Carpet Python talk, because mm. you've got a lot of Carpet Python stuff to talk about, I thought we would talk about, like, what was your recent herb trip? You went to Thailand, right? Yeah. Uh, and Vietnam. Yeah. Oh, cool. And Vietnam. Yeah. So how was uh, it? Our old friend Chris Salemi and uh, the goat, Ryan Young. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> like, nice. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun, but it ended up being more of a sort of a cultural sort of experience than a herping trip. I mean, oh, you know, okay. you've, you've been on big international herping trips before, and sometimes it goes great. Sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> um, sometimes <Yes. laughs> all the, the best laid plans, you can't control the weather months in advance. And uh, it should have been one month after the end of the rainy season, and uh, it didn't get the memo. It rained most of the days we were there. Oh. It was oh. it, yeah. It was unusually cold and rainy, uh, so it really kind of uh, put the schnitzel on a lot of herping. Mm. We found gotcha. a few things here and there. Uh, I did manage to road cruise three elephants, so that was unexpected. So, uh, like elephant, that's like cool, elephant, that, okay, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like you're you're out four hours in the back of a standing up in the back of a pickup truck, holding onto a roll bar, driving a million miles an hour through the Khao Sok National Park in Thailand, and. No, only one road killed cobra, an only snake we saw all night, but did cruise three elephants that were just on the road, <laughs> on the side of the road. So, Jesus, yeah, especially no, for you was, being like a uh, wool sure. mammoth type guy, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I was the, a little uh... surprised, uh, <laughs> I did not expect to see that at that all. Cool. Free ranging elephants, so and Chris just nice lost it. He's standing next to me in the back of his truck, and I just say, like, we shot, we overshot the first elephant. And then Chris looks at me and goes, wait, that was real? Like, <laughs> thought it was a fake elephant? Like, he was just dumbfounded as a real elephant just on the road. Like, and then we saw a few other ones that same night. So that was it was it was fun. Cool people. Yeah, Chris was telling me about the, 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 the plane, like the switching over from spot to spot. I was like, wow, man. Woo. <laughs> yeah, it, it the older I get, the less I'm into the traveling aspect of getting to the other part, other side of the planet. It's just to get to, we went to Kat Ba Island off the course of Northern coast of Vietnam and uh, spent a lot of time looking. There's an endemic cave gecko that only lives on Kat Ba Island and we didn't find any, but it wasn't for any lack of searching, mm. but just to get there, I mean, you know, you're three hours out of Bangkok to Hanoi and then you're like a, three hours in a bus and then you're like changing buses and then you're in a ferry and then you're in a car and then you're on another bus. It's, it's a lot of work to get there. To, to not find to just to find the gecko, just to look for the gecko. Yeah. And not find it. Yeah. It's so, it was yeah. fun. Uh, well, that's, unlike that, Australia, that's the fun of herping. Oh, is it? <laughs> so, uh, I, don't, I, I think that, the failures are the only thing that give the successes meaning. If every time you yes. went, you just found everything, it wouldn't be that much fun. 
Yeah, right. Yeah. It's like the it's like the guys who spend their whole life searching searching for like sunken Spanish treasure ships in the Caribbean or something, and thirty years of searching, and then they finally the elation when they finally find something. Hmm. It's only because they spent all this time, you know, searching unsuccessfully. You ever either of you guys ever play golf? A couple yeah. times, yeah. Yeah, it's fun, yeah, except you know, so if you're not good at it when you're learning, I'm no good at it at all. I but. suck at it, yeah. <laughs> no, me you neither. Can just, you can whiff it like 10 times in a row, and you get up, oh, but the first time you actually get some wood on it and knock the crap out of it, you feel like you're on cloud nine. And so it's a bit like that. I think mm -hmm. the, it only feels, feels that good when you really drive the crap out of that ball because you just made 10 divots before that. Right, and yeah. Right. So you need that. 100%. Southeast Asia is fun for anybody that's never been. It's it's so inexpensive. It's like other than getting there, everything's almost free. Uh, it's so cheap. I was we were in Hanoi and we stayed one night in Hanoi just by the airport in a hotel. Uh, and we're flying, we're taking off for the island the next morning, and there's like a little tiny restaurant where they're literally washing dishes of the street on the street basically by hand. It's I got this. We got a big bowl of noodles with beef and all the you know, all the options, all the bells and whistles and everything is huge. It's amazing. And you're eating this. And I did the math in my head and I realized like, this just costs 42 cents. Jesus. Like, this whole bowl of oh, noodles. Wow. It's like the most expensive thing they had on the menu is 42 cents. Yeah, this is great. Like, So I gained 11 pounds in 13 days. <laughs> the opposite of Australia, <laughs> where you're eating out of like, you know, um, gas station meat pies and stuff yeah hey, don't do not talk I, I, do not, I, do not my, pies. I do not knock the gas station meat pie i only oh, speak truth <laughs> sometimes <laughs> when you get like the, the places that make their own sausage roll the big fatty sausage in the middle it's so good in australia yeah. oh, i love it along with the ice break coffee mm. you're golden, yeah, you're right? golden. Like, you know, all the time every day <laughs> <laughs> my last trip to australia I gained 17 pounds in two weeks jesus and you know what like yeah. after two weeks like nine pounds of it was still there it was legit weight like <laughs> i have this wow. weird like obsession with that kind of stuff when i'm at home and then i go on vacation i just go completely insane like not i don't just eat whatever i want like i almost go out of my way to destroy all my progress <laughs> do you do with vacations it's fine. i'm I'm gonna undo ten uh, years, five years yeah. of uh... <laughs> several months worth of work is destroyed in five minutes. Yeah. It's all the street food and stuff. We're in Vietnam, and there's these. It's always like a million year old lady with a little thing of boiling oil, and they're like deep frying, like you know, it's almost like a they took like a banana and smushed it, and then dipped it in like a pancake batter, and then deep fried it. So it's like this crispy banana donut thing. It's like six thousand degrees. Okay. And it's amazing because you know it is because it's cooked in like a dirty pot of oil on a, on, in a street. Like, so, you know, it's good. Mm. That's, and it was the greatest thing. And, you know, it was better than eating that. Eating like five of them. Like, just keep <laughs> eating more of them. Just keep going. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I if they're what. 46 cents. Yeah, 25 cents will buy you 12. It's like, oh, cool. Yeah. And Ryan no. and Chris. I, mean, I love Ryan and Chris to death. But let's face it. These are guys who are not paragons of fitness. And even they were like, why are you eating so much? <laughs> What are you doing? <laughs> like, 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 I think Chris did control. say that to me. He's like, he's like, Nick is eating everything. Everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's on vacation. I'm paying yeah. for it still. <laughs> Doesn't mm. count over there. It's fine. You'd think I'd learn after this long, but nope. Yeah. Nah. Yeah. That's that's it. So um <clears throat> all right. Let's uh I did. Let's let's start with it. I thought this was a good question. This came in from uh, Miles Picker, right? And he says, "Knowing your background in auto body and fabrication, how much <laughs> and what of his housing enclosure knowledge has he done DIY? And what kind of uh, mechanicals is he running? What are some of the biggest mistakes he made early on in his career, and what were the solutions?" Well, that's a whole show. I think about the I mean, yeah, that'd be a whole show unto itself. Well, I didn't. <laughs> didn't Nick make the walk-in incubator out of like a closet or something like that in his house? Or no, that's that's a freestanding room in my oh, laundry. Yeah. Room. I have an oversized laundry room, so it's kind of cordoned off and made a little walk-in incubator. That's been a triumphant success, actually. <laughs> yeah. So it's I mean, yeah. Why? <laughs> I've I've always been 
I mean, not to go too long, you know, wax poetically too long about my own life and upbringing and where I came from, but I was the poor kid. Like, seriously, like, mom's working, single mom, working two jobs, latchkey kid, you know, government cheese, poor, food stamps, you know, right. extremely poor. And it, and I kind of had a lot of friends who were not poor. And so you kind of want what all your friends have, but, you know, your friend's parents just buy them a new car, but you got to go get a job washing dishes to buy some. 30 year old piece of shit, you know, this kind of stuff. So when you're really poor, you, you have to just learn to do stuff and fix stuff because you can't afford stuff that isn't broken. And so I, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. So they say, mm-hmm. so I learned a lot of that kind of stuff, mechanical abilities. So yeah, early on. And even now I make, no one can see it by design, hence the green screen behind me, but this, my office is going to be, I need another baby room. So I'll have like, Three baby rooms and three different buildings, technically, or three rooms. Uh, one for yearlings and grow outs, one for babies, and one for the adults. And they're all technically in different buildings. Uh, that's what I'm building behind me, but I'm building it all myself. Like, I'll partly because the wait time anymore, it's like the craziest thing. Like, I could probably afford to just buy some, but you can't, I don't want to wait a year to get it. <laughs> you don't want to have to do all that lead time that they have for a rack. Yeah, that, I've had a couple yeah. of guys that I've had custom build me stuff to spec. And it's like, and you know, I had a bit of a falling out with one of those guys and one of them kind of quit building cages. And so now I'm like, I got to do this myself again, but it's because you know, if you build it yourself, you get exactly the height, the width, exactly what you want that fits mm-hmm. exactly to your specs. You're not trying to fit right. or adapt something someone else made uh, to your purposes. So, so I'll have the, this room should house about 350. Uh, Only 350 babies? I mean, you know. That's for my plan is just for the current year. So the 2023 babies will go in here, and as long as it don't hatch more than 350 of them or so, I should have a problem. Yeah, that was that. Why'd you throw that out in the universe? It's like if only I can only have 350. <laughs> it's like you're gonna have like eight sets of twins that push well, it just over that line. It, yeah. In all fairness, it's my job. Like, it's, yeah. like you know, uh, my my hobby got so big, I didn't have time to go to work anymore. So I just started doing that. But, uh, I try to not have more than about 300-ish babies because the workload, if you don't have employees just as a single person, gets to be a lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The reason for the baby room is that I just like in my old age, I think some of these babies need a little bit more space than I've been able to give them. So by having a secondary room, I'm able to basically double the hatchling tub size. So I'm not going to have more snakes. I'm not going to produce more snakes. I'm just going to, each snake is going to have more space and not be quite so packed nice. uh, in there and stuff. So. Are, you, are, are you going for like a six quart size tub or is that? This is going to make me sound really stupid, but I have no idea what a six quart tub is. Like I, there's certain yeah. things in the hobby that like everybody knows. Box? I don't know. They talk about six quart or 12 quart. Like I have no idea. What does that even mean? <laughs> what are the dimensions of the tub that would be a, a six quart tub? I don't know. It's like people tell me what a. I think it's oh, like. They start talking about rats and they tell me like a, oh, it's like a 150 gram rat or a 250 gram rat. Like I have never weighed a rat in my, <laughs> in my in life. life. I have no idea what that means. Even my mouse guy doesn't even, it's like, oh, my, my fuzzies are, you know, this many grams. Like I don't, what, I don't know what that means. Like I just. <laughs> Look at the snake and look at the rodent, and I know if that snake will fit in that rodent, and that's <laughs> the rodent will fit in that snake. I don't. So I, I just, I'm like old school. I'm like length, width, height. You know the tub dimensions, quart size. Don't know. I, okay, I think so, they're like. Uh, what would you say, Owen? Thirteen inches long, four inches to, wide, four inches. I'm trying tall, to get an exact maybe? thing for it. It's like the size of a shoebox. Yeah, I'm going with the uh, the 350 I'm building will be like an iris shoe boxes, so they're about yeah. 14 inches, yeah. 15 inches, yeah, about five yeah. and a half wide, okay. about four high. And I had a because you used to use the small ones that I did, right? I got it from you. It was like those. Yeah, those, like, but it, but I have yeah. 500 of those tubs, which is a lot. Yeah, uh, and they're great for like baby carpets, like right when they hatch. But if they're around for any amount of time, that's they got grow that quickly. Uh, I'll right, still keep right. about a hundred of them on hand for anteresia and really small stuff. It, I I love them for corn snakes, rhino rat yeah. snakes, and yeah, uh, mad hogs. I gave yeah. them all to Owen. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Said, yeah. yeah, I yeah, yeah I know. Use the iris boxes for the baby carpets. Now I've actually had like a few hundred uh, custom three D printed perch assemblies with waterable holders for them all. So I'll have a you know it'll be a 
nice a bit better they can be in there a bit longer without outgrowing it in three months or whatever so um, so yeah and then the in the grow out room it'll be more v18s v15s v18s and and on up i think the v18 is like a great tub for yeah holdbacks and stuff it's you know so i've got a i've got oh, a, yeah so currently I have racks all over the place that are just like I've picked up here and there, like that there's nowhere to put them until I get all this big changeover done after I'm done cycling this year. So you never turn down a rack. You just, you know, I'll bring it home. I'll find a spot for it later. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah. I find a good, you know, good <laughs> deal. It's like, geez, it's like, you know, stuff's not cheap. No. So how's your yeah. season going so far? Uh, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm like, I have the same process every year and it works for me. So I'm not, I'm reluctant to change it. And that is, I set out what my goals, what I want to try to do. I pair everything. Nothing breeds. I get immediately like super discouraged and super pessimistic. And I just start talking myself down, convince myself the end of the world is happening and nothing's going to lay eggs. And it's going to be a complete disaster. And then usually a lot of it goes and it's not too bad, but I'm in that, I'm right at that point where nothing's going to go and it's all a disaster. But I've been doing this a long time. So. Is this where I got my method? Because like that sounds exactly what I, I do in so. my Like I got it's yelled at for walking like around, <laughs> going like nothing's gonna breed last year. And then when all the eggs shot get, showed up, I got yelled at. Yeah. I've got a lot of like I think a lot of small clutches coming. A lot of female carpets are like getting you know they get kind of firm before they ovulate. And you're like, yeah, mm-hmm. you know you're you know they're gonna ovulate, but they're not that big. It's like you're not gonna lay a lot of eggs, but I think there's gonna be a lot of a fair number of smaller clutches. Uh, there's a few things I, I, I refuse to get my hopes up for that are just like some of these long suffering projects you've been trying for 10 years to no avail that I got a little more reason for optimism on a few of these things this year, probably. So yeah, I refuse. They refuse to get excited. It's again. Like, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, you, I've been trying to produce albino olive pythons for nine breeding seasons. This is oh the ninth God. consecutive year yeah. of pairing them. Uh, and every year the same thing happens. The male albino breeds the, the females build a few follicles. The male breeds them one time, loses interest, they reabsorb, and then I re- wash, rinse, repeat. <laughs> right here. It's ridiculous. <laughs> um, but this year I, I'm getting more breeding activity, including with females that have huge follicles and a little bit. So it's like, oh, is this the year finally after a decade? Is number 10 the top of the year? Like, but we'll see. I'm not gonna didn't get it take you up. ten years to produce. Didn't take you ten years to just produce olive pythons in the past, like just regular olive pythons. And you work on that for like yeah, a long time. Yeah, that's kind of well. That was like trying to breed them with one pair, and then I got a, a second male, let him fight one time, and then I got eggs every year. Yep, just like, that was it. Yeah, <laughs> that's just like oh, a hundred percent. That's what happened over here. It's like once yeah. you piss off the male with another one, he oh, yeah. knows the score and it's good. It's like okay, you gotta watch out though because they'll kill each other and even eat each other. Yeah, they're not, they're like you know, wrestling carpets, which I do routinely to keep them motivated where it's kind of a largely ritualized sort of a thing. It's like the olives. It's like, it goes quickly from like shoving to bite, constrict and kill Yep. and or eat. Like it's fast. Like you, you got to stand there the whole time. And as soon as they start getting worked up, you separate them before. Otherwise it can go bad. No but thanks. Very effective. <clears throat> uh, we got a question from, uh, from the chat, it says, uh, "At what millimeter follicle size do carpet, carpet pythons ovulate at?" I want to say it's like twenty-five, maybe. Is never it? ultrasounded a carpet. I I that's never measured the ultrasounded carpets that I did. <laughs> like, no, I never, <laughs> never felt possessed to buy an ultrasound machine. Honestly, <laughs> carpets are pretty easy to breed. Like it doesn't. The use of ultrasound and breeding pythons is really more about like ball python people trying to breed one male to 47 females and mass produce ball python morphs. That's where that all really got going. Uh, in carpets, I'm never trying to make a million of any one thing. And you can usually, they're easy to palpate and you just, you pay attention to your snakes and you know when to put, you, you just know. They're just not that hard. So not to make it seem like everything I do is super easy, but it's pretty easy. So a lot of it, it's not that, it's not that hard. Uh, Plus, I'm old, and the technology. Do you know how hard long it take me to learn how to use an ultrasound machine? <laughs> the I, eggs would be on the ground by the time I you figured it out. Yeah. Do it because I wouldn't be able to figure it out. Like, 
I uh, I did. Um, I, I I usually use it as a uh, a check to like. It's like I think they're in there. Yeah, there they are, and that's pretty much the yeah, but, ultrasound. Yeah. Oh, and you're I, doing like you're also doing like white lips and stuff. You know what I mean? So those are here. Yes. <laughs> you're doing like harder to breed species and stuff. So weird I, shit. Yeah. yeah. I can't imagine figuring the ultrasound thing out. Like. This is how technologically backwards I am. I've been paying for Hulu for like four years because I, I can't figure out how to cancel Hulu. Like, you think I'm gonna? If I can't figure out how to cancel Hulu, you think I'm gonna be able to figure out how to use the ultrasound machine reliably? I doubt it. I, uh, I literally have you're every, giving Gen X a bad name. Hey, this is not good, dude. <laughs> I'm currently paying for every single television streaming service that exists. Because I can't them. turn them off. Some of them, I don't know how to cancel any of them. I can't even figure that out. I, I try for like a few minutes, get pissed. I'm like, ah, screw it. And then I just keep paying. Shut up, take my money, assholes. Yeah, it's like, I mean, I got them all. Like, it's like, there's, I don't know of any major one I just paid for. And I don't, I don't think I've ever actually an Paramount app. Plus even once. Why am I paying for this? Because I can't figure out how to cancel. The, <laughs> there's actually an app that will do that for you, Nick. Yeah, yeah. Probably, probably wouldn't be able to figure the app figure out. The app out. Yeah, <laughs> I won't think it's just... you just gotta hit install. <laughs> Lucas, get the app and help. Uh, I'm telling you, oh I my got, goodness, Lucas has become my tech support. Man. We know. <laughs> well, he's failing you, man. What the yeah, hell? Yeah, what's that hell? <laughs> Yelling him some more. Uh, <laughs> Lucas is great. He's a <laughs> yeah, I love this. Yeah, we'll keep it. Yeah, so you say, yeah, you just kind of put them together and Carp Python's easy, but I'm with Riley in the chat. Um, I, I can't figure out Darwin's to save my life. You say they're the same. I don't know. What am I doing wrong, Nick? I, I, I to know. me, they just what, seem different. Do you, I, I don't know. They're, how many Darwin's do you your have? Recipe. How many do you have? Uh, five. Okay, so it's not just one lazy pair that doesn't want to do anything. No, no, nope. Man, uh, I've not had too much trouble with Darwin's. Generally speaking, uh, the babies are a bit more challenging to get feeding than a lot of the other stuff is. Yeah, that I've heard. Yep. But getting them to breed and you know lay is usually not really a problem. Are you combating the males? I've done that. Mm. Like, how much yeah, are you combating? Like. Uh, I'd say put the, the male you want to breed, if, d keep them separate for like a week, put the male with the female you want to breed, then put the other male in there and let them get extremely agitated to where it's like, to where you start hearing that thumping as they're slamming each other into the side of the cage and it's like, and it's getting violent. Then you pull the support, the male you don't want to breed out so that the male that you want to breed thinks he won. He thinks the other one ran off and he vanquished his rival and then he claims the spoils of victory. Um, but you gotta like let him let him get good and worked up. Okay. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't sis out like as soon as they start like doing the, the <laughs> dance. You know, what I mean? it's not like I'm like no, get him out of there. Whatever. Oh but, god, yeah, I don't know. I thought maybe. Well, let me ask this question: How much do you think that the weather plays a factor in what we do? You know, like that whole saying of like, you know, people say that they don't drop their room temperature, but the weather outside drops, so naturally your room is going to drop a little bit. Do you think that that has effects, especially it, on that? It absolutely does. Uh, the reality is that everybody cycles their snakes. Everybody, even the people that don't cycle their snakes, are cycling their snakes. Even if you don't touch the thermostat, you don't make any adjustments, you don't do anything differently, everything stays the same. It gets colder in the winter. If you live mm -hmm. in the northern hemisphere, it's impossible for that not to happen. May not happen much, but even a little bit. If it over a regular, the older I get, the less I'm convinced it's any particular temperature, but more that enough change has occurred that they are keyed into knowing that that and a, a seasonal rhythm, even if it's mm -hmm. mild. So a five degree mm -hmm. drop might be enough in an animal that's used to that for five, six, seven years, and just that always happens, and it kind of. They get in a rhythm with what you're doing. So, right. yeah, absolutely. Which is why it's like some of well, the harder species, you got to get them into the rhythm, and it takes a couple of years for them to go with you. Well, a mistake a lot of people make. My thoughts were going. Go ahead. Go ahead. I say a huge mistake a lot of people make trying to breed pythons, particularly oddball, hard to breed things, is that they, they do what they think is going to bring about a successful outcome, and they don't get any eggs. 
So then they think, well, that wasn't it. I'll do something different next year. <laughs> Completely different and next time. Work. And yeah. then they do something else. I'll get them super cold. I won't get them cold at all. I'll miss the crap out of them. They're just doing different things every year because they think there's a magical recipe that they just need to hit the right combination of things, of stimulus and success. And what they really need to do is leave them the hell alone. Just do the same thing for five years and they're going to mm -hmm. lag. It's like they will adjust to what you are doing. But if you constantly... You know, pythons, particularly females, they don't want a stressful environment to if they're going to ovulate. They need to be right. in a low-stress environment. If the weather, basically your artificially induced weather, keeps changing year to year and there's no seasonal rhythm and everything's different every year, they never get into that groove. Mm -hmm. So just steady as she goes. You know, basically give them a, you know, a relatively low-stress and consistent environment. And that's your road to success for most of these things. Just do the same thing over and over again. <laughs> I don't so really change it. I sort of, yeah, sort of, stay. but you know, my, my thoughts were going to like, you know, I'm thinking like, uh, the Northern territory area is more monsoon. Is it, is it, does, does that pressure drop from outside play into effect into effect more than say with a coastal carpet or jungle carpet or something like that. But then I have no problem breeding poplin carpet. So to me, that that's what sort of like is the, you know, I can't figure yeah. out. You know, and it's, I have I have all the different lines, so it's not like they're I haven't tried with different you know different animals with that are unrelated related you know I just you know, can't another, get it I don't know another factor with these things that it's not you know it's no fun to really speculate about and that is just random luck like we're trying to breed yeah. live animals and they have a say in whether or not they reproduce like it's not entirely up to us. <laughs> And sometimes, you know, people get lucky and you see people breed things that you can't believe that, you know, this person bred this thing. You're just shocked that that happened and you, or you're shocked that it didn't happen in other cases. It's like there's a no matter how much, you know, or how much you understand or how much you think, you know, or how much experience you have. There's a bit of a random luck sort of factor involved in all of these things. Right. Sometimes it might be that, you know, everything there is to know about carpets and you just got some snakes that are unmotivated and bad luck and. <laughs> and it happens. Like yeah, I've bred, happens. Could be. Yeah. I've bred a yeah. I've bred a considerable number of python species at this point. And there are some things I'm just cursed. I'm cursed with ringed pythons and sabu pythons. Won't even go near them. I've tried like three times. Like it just it's just not meant to be. Like I don't know. I don't I've know washed my hands of savus. Yeah. What? I washed my hands of Savus. I'm not no more. Uh -uh. I, have, I have one lonely bachelor male. That's it. It's just always like some weird comedy of errors. Why can't I breed these snakes? So I don't know. It's I bred all their relatives. You know, that's what, the what only, not that? actually that's the only liasis that you can actually obtain. Well, that's I how I feel with Darwin. I've bred Fuscus, olives, <laughs> maclots. I bred freaking Dunai even. Like, I can them Sabus. That's the... It's the last one on the damn, like, in the tree. Come on. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I, I'm it's telling son you. Son of I, a I, bitch. I, son of a God damn it. I don't know. It, 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 there are those that just, yeah, I can't breed Brazilian rainbow bows. I've tried that several times over the years, too. I'm just never going to try that again. I'm done. <laughs> They're cool, but that's for somebody else to do, not me. <laughs> I have to... Yeah. Uh, I have to try mine in a couple of years and uh, uh, figure out my ring python oh, situation. You have them. I, I dude, I have that. so many things now. I don't even remember. Ring yeah. pythons are, uh, that's a, scare the crap cool, out of me. What? <laughs> they Ring pythons scare the crap out of me. You know, they like the scare only me, but they are, they are the undisputed world's heavyweight champions of dropping dead for no reason. Like just, oh look, you're dead for no reason. You yeah. ate on Tuesday and now you're dead. It's Wednesday. For imagine that. Like you nothing. <laughs> like, oh look. And it's not just my experience. They do it to everybody. It's Everyone. Like, yep. I don't know why. I don't know what it is about them. Something it's gotta be husbandry related. There's something we're doing or not doing that is that, affecting them. Yeah. That is affecting them. But I don't know what it is. Um but I just I've sworn them off now. I'm like I'm not dealing with these things. My uh, my one female got, came to me because her original owner got fed up that she's killed and eaten two mates, and ring pythons aren't cheap. <laughs> like you can't like, <laughs> like she she killed and ate one, and he gave her another chance. <laughs> like you know that's. <laughs> so no, I've I've got a I've got a a very lonely prothensis female that's done that. She's killed two males. She ate the last one. <laughs> Literally ate it. Oh, wow. Put it in there and 
I go in there and she has killed him and completely ate him and then of course spit him up like four days later. Oh god. Like, I'm done. You don't get any more males. This is <laughs> getting hard to replace. Like, is they're not cheap either or easy to get. <laughs> no more for no, you. Forget no, it. Well, she, yeah. the, she killed the two younger males. The only male I have left is like my old ass original one. He's like 13 years old. He's like this scrawny old ancient snake. And I'm like, I don't dare risk him. <laughs> yeah, uh, put him in there. It's over. No. Yeah. No. I'm like, I love those snakes, but they're murdery. I've had, I've never had a pretensus die of natural causes. <laughs> I have had. Jesus. Three of them died it's from murder. Murder, yeah, it's all murder. Died and all of them were murdered. All were murdered. Jesus. Uh, yeah, I've had a, a yeah. female killed a male, a male killed a male, and a female ate a male. I put two males together to let them kind of fight a little bit because the interies will get they'll get you know pissy with each other too. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it wasn't for very long. I didn't even see him do anything, but then the next day, one male was dead. Like <laughs> it must have like. Squeeze ever done something, it's like murder. Just, like, just stretched him out, and killed him in the long I don't run. No, like Jesus. yeah, they always die from foul play. I'm like, <laughs> not. Uh, it's one of my favorite. There's the doctor. Jeez, man. Oh, Rubbing it in. That's well, so yeah, strange. I've never Justin, had that's so strange. There's Justin. <laughs> I've never <laughs> had a <laughs> baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just rub uh, salt in that wound okay yeah i'm not, I'm not ever giving this the uh female the most murdery one is never getting another chance it's like yes. you've had two strikes this is nope no i'm not, not gonna do it again so, i do have a couple of young so females I thought... from justin so okay hopefully non-murdered line I, got it um i I often say that i think that you and owen have the best caramels in the u.s and I thought that we would talk about caramel carpets and maybe talk about hypos as well and how the two and interact and whatnot and the differences maybe between them. And then um, my thoughts were like where, I mean, I'll listen to you guys talk about it, but like where are you taking the project? I, I would just want to put up so people can see in case you haven't seen one of Nick's caramels. There you go. I was looking at that one like earlier. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that's a nice looking snake. And then I think he has uh this one. I, I don't know if this is the same one, but this one stood out to me too. And I think you maybe it's a holdback of yours, Nick, but <clears throat> that thing is smoking. <laughs> Wait, Still loading. Is really nice. There it is. Oh, that's the bro. I actually sold that one like a dingling. That's the brother of the other one. <laughs> Um, oh. <laughs> well, somebody's like, yeah. lucky. That's yeah, somebody got under. that, and they're happy. Yeah, uh, yeah, but they're. Yeah. Uh, I, I like the caramels and super caramels quite a bit. Um, yeah. Someone posted. I, I posted a picture because I just I'm out there taking pictures of snakes that are people want pictures. You know, you know, it's like you're selling a snake mm. and everybody wants. No matter how many pictures you have, or how recent the picture is, or how good the picture is, they would like some more pictures. Right. Pretty much always like i literally put like on my website i literally have the date i took the picture it's like and i get people it's like three days later can i get some more pictures and i'm getting to be a curmudgeonly old man and now i'm just like no the picture is like three days old i'm not taking another picture it's like I take good pictures that are good pictures like somebody great. wanted uh somebody yeah. recent last year wanted video and i'm like you want me to put it, this today's newspaper in with it like what are we doing here like i'll like because i wanted you know, two videos the first, as soon as somebody does the the video thing or they want some verification that it's the right animal and i just like say look like if you don't Come trust on, me like you you, you came to me. me you know you should, <laughs> you should only give money to people you trust and if you think i'm some sort of a scumbag is going to rip likely to rip you off then you know you should not give me any of your money you should go find somebody you have more confidence in <laughs> right buy from that person so mm -hmm. now with the caramels and the hypos so what and all of, and red coastals and all of that sort of stuff. Um, the caramels and super caramels we have now, I mean, when caramels first became a thing, everybody, not everybody, there was a vocal, you know, group of people who were like, that's just a red coastal. You know, the accusation was that it was just a, just a normal red coastal that you know, you're trying to sell for more money. Mm -hmm. uh, and that eventually, you know, the proof's in the pudding. It's, it's not that. And then when hypos 
become a thing, then it, oh, that's just a caramel now, which was previously also a red coastal. Right. And and that proves that that's not what that is either and stuff. Uh, the thing with caramels, uh, and I guess you could say red coastals as well, is you've had a lot of, you've had 40 years to refine red coastals. 40 years. Four decades. Yeah. Uh, to refine red coastals. Uh, it is not surprising, therefore, that you have some pretty nice looking red coastals. I would be profoundly disappointed in the hobby if you didn't after with 40 years to play with something. Mm -hmm. uh, and I looked at, I produced my, fir my first super caramels 12 years ago. So I've just been breeding supers to supers and keeping the best supers from super to super pairings who had super caramel grandparents. Like you, you do get, you, you do move the ball forward. Uh, more mm -hmm. certain, you know, can still be selectively bred. And it's not that, it's not really that you've, that, you've made the caramel gene better. It's that the caramel gene or any mutation basically does the same thing in every animal that has that mutation. It's just doing its thing. It's all the other genes that, that animal has that code for various aspects of pigment synthesis and pigment distribution. Those other genes still get a say in the ultimate phenotype. Mm -hmm. And so really when you selectively breed a morph, what you're really doing is selectively breeding the other genes that that animal has to kind of complement and accentuate the, the attributes of that morph. So right. it's not that my caramels are better than anybody else's. If anything, it's just that I've refined the non-caramel genes to complement the caramel gene more effectively. And it's not, I mean, there, I think it was, was it Mike Cross? Yeah, Mike, I Mike is absolutely much. like about blew my retinas out the back of my head. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, so it's not, I'm not the only one that's, you know, producing animals at that level from that gene. Uh, I, know, I, so I guess I might be biased too. But <laughs> <laughs> as far as like you and Owen being the ones, like I, I just see you guys all the time. You're right, Mike. I did forget about Mike, but he has nice ones too. So really yeah. nice ones. Yeah. Uh, you know, with I, I posted the picture of that super because I just was taking pictures of animals of some scrub pythons in the same area. I'm like, just what else can I take a picture of to post a picture once in a while if I can remember to do it? I took that picture of her, um, and uh. Somebody posted, oh, and it's not even a hypo. It's like, it's like we're about 10 years behind with the hypo thing. It's like, give me 10 years. And yeah. I am now, I'm at the point in the game now with the hypo gene that I was 12 years ago with Carmel. Like, mm -hmm. just produced less than a year ago my first probable super hypos that I'll need to then prove out and go through all these steps. And it's like, give me 12 years and three generations of refining supers and breeding supers as supers and keeping the best supers from super parents and this sort of stuff. And I expect you'll see some spectacular things. Yeah. That is one of the probably is it's probably a super. Yeah. Uh, I have some reasons to believe that. However, anything that's, you know, new, I guess you have to prove it out. You can't just, Oh, I think that one's a super because it's the nicest looking one in the clutch or one of a few really extreme ones in the clutch, you have to do the due diligence and prove it out. So I have a, I have a few females that I'm tiger females that I'm raising up that are not caramels. They're not red. They can't make red babies. They are just normal gray tigers and exanthic tigers to breed these supers to. So I actually have like 2.2 probable super hypo tigers and I will not breed them together the first year. Okay. I will breed them each all of them to uh animals that cannot make red offspring of any sort uh thus to test to see and you know if they are in fact supers once i have proven supers that are males and proven female supers then i can just breed them together forever and all, then all the babies are by default supers and not to keep proving things out that's what i did with the caramels many years ago uh and why i can just make whole clutches of supers and don't have to prove anything out i can mm. guarantee it this is i have to do that with this right as well I did make a, a two super oh, caramel exantics this year, though. That was oh, cool. cool. How do well, they I think they're super caramels, but I couldn't because of the parentage. I can't guarantee that that's what they are. I had to. I had to. You have to send me pictures of those because I have. Uh, I did a clutch of caramel hat the caramel hat, and I have no idea what that I'm looking at. I'm just feeding them and growing them up and hoping I can figure it out later. <laughs> and it's not getting any easier. So. Well, you the, the ones that are exantics should be pretty obvious right out of the gate. And the exantic caramels aren't too hard to tell. Mm. Um, 
these only two super caramel xanthics I produce, and I'm extremely confident that they are. There is one tell of on a super caramel on the side of the neck that almost always tells you. Okay, that's what it is. And both of the ones I produced this year had very, very prominent. That marking was very prominent and very obvious. Um, and they were from a what did I breed a caramel tiger jag head xanthic to a caramel an xanthic caramel female. So my odds were you know Pretty one good. and eight. Yeah, and I got two, uh, but. I, there, then again, I will still breed this thing to a normal female coastal and then make sure that it is, in fact, a super caramel before mm -hmm. I make any grand assumptions. But I'd be real surprised if it didn't prove out, but still got to do that to be sure. So with um, your <clears throat> with the hypo, are you just doing hypo tigers? Are you doing normal hypos, too? Um, uh, it's kind of one of those things where the tiger thing is kind of taken over. Um Mm -hmm. I only had one pair of non uh, of hypos that weren't tigers, but their mother was a tiger. Basically, the first clutch of hypos that Paul produced, mm -hmm. uh, he bred the original male to a tiger that uh, I sent over to him years and like 13 years ago or something crazy. And that was the parentage. Mm -hmm. And so I got a pair, I talked to him about a pair of hypos from that very first clutch before a year older than anybody else got any babies. Mm -hmm. But the only ones he would sell me were the ones that weren't striped. Basically, there was two, a pair of hypos that weren't tigers <laughs> out of the clutch. Okay. And that's the pair I got. Not a stripe on them at all. And all the rest of them were striped. That's the ones I got. <laughs> yeah. And then no stripes. Yeah. I got, so then I bred. Uh, I bred the two non-striped hypos that had the tiger mother. I bred them together and made, I have uh, stripes. Yeah. Yeah. I made, <laughs> I made stripes in the second generation. Not great, not great tigers, but as good as a lot of things people call tigers these days yep. uh, from non-striped parents. Cause they have a lot of those alleles, just not quite enough to show individually, but uh, through the magic of polygenic traits, you put them together and a small percentage of babies will get enough of them to line up. Uh, I also have a an adult female hypo tiger head exanthic. Nice. That's the offspring of. Nice. Yeah, but it's uh, the only reason it's a tiger, or, or, you know, when they, you know, modest stripe on it is because that further back in the ancestry. There was a tiger somewhere there in there. Yeah. Tiger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was happy. It's like a bit of a shortcut so I can breed her straight to an exanthic tiger in another year and hopefully make exanthic ghosts tigers or ghost uh, i don't know what they yeah it, it's like you're ghost getting to that tiger. point yeah ghost tigers i don't know <laughs> I, I didn't are you are you playing it on tigers, play but it's it's kind of going that way just because they're all keep all the ones that keep holding back seem to be striped so nice uh, um hold on are you planning on crossing the hypo and the caramel together never ha Cool. Never, never, <laughs> never give that. I will never do that ever, 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 never, never, ever. No. Uh, I also don't okay. own any red coastals other than Brisbane's, but that's a self contained thing. I would never breed a Brisbane anything that wasn't a Brisbane. So that's kind of its own little thing. Uh, I think that's a, it just opens a giant problem. Um, Caramel and hypo are definitively yeah. separate genes. That has been proven in abundance. They are not related. They are not allelic. They are not compatible. Full stop. Okay. Um, and the combo, the hypo caramel combination is a really good looking snake. The problem comes if you breed a hypo to a caramel, you'll get 75% of the babies are going to be some sort of red thing. 25% are normal. Well, that's obvious. There are 25% of those are not either of those genes. Then you've got to figure out what the other three out of four babies is. Um, the hypo caramels in the first generation stand out because they're the ones that glow. They're ridiculous. Um, caramels and hypos don't look that similar as babies usually, mm. but both of those and red coastals by extension. Also, all of those things have a range of expression in what they can look like. And those ranges all overlap. So yeah. while most of the time, a red coastal and a caramel are harder to tell apart than uh, either of them is with a hypo is a little bit more distinctive, but at the low end of the threshold on the hypo and the high end of expression on the other, you do get overlap sometimes where it could be murky and you got to know what you have. Uh, I think it's not, I mean, 
if, if someone buys a snake from me, I have to guarantee that it is genetically or whatever I said it was. It has to be that. And if it's not what I said it was, that's a huge problem. It's mm -hmm. frankly, it's very difficult to fix. How do you fix that? Oh, I'm sorry. The, the caramel I sold you or the hypo I sold you is a caramel or the caramel I sold you is a red coastal. How can you fix that four years later after they've cared for it and they fed it and they've, you know, plan this project out and then it turns out to not be that thing, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's very difficult to fix. So I just, I just won't take the chance. So as pretty as a hypo caramel is, uh, and if you ask Paul, not that Paul will go on a podcast or anything, he won't even go on, he won't even go on my podcast. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Becoming even more reclusive. Uh, but if, if you I ask know. him, he will tell you it eventually becomes a mess because he, he was a little smarter about it in that he bred hypo to known super caramel. So, you know, automatically all the babies are caramel. Right. And then half of them are also hypos. And it was really obvious which ones those were. But then he bred hypo caramels that he knew for sure were hypo caramels and bred them to each other and bred them to super caramels and this kind of stuff. And you just keep making a lot of really, really, really nice looking snakes that you don't know what they are. Because imagine uh -huh. if you bred a hypo caramel to a hypo caramel. Yeah. And you run that Panette square and any combination of any of those genes makes a red baby. You end up with a clutch where I think only one out of every 16 offspring wouldn't be red. 15 out of 16 babies are red. Um, but you can have caramels, super caramels, hypos, super hypos, hypo caramels, super hypo caramels, super caramel, hypos, super caramel, super hypos. And you're supposed to tell what all those things are. Good luck. You'll never, you'll never <laughs> figure it out. Ever. No. You'll never no. figure it out. You'll know, like, when they get older, if it's has at least a copy of the hypo gene, because it'll have certain effects. But was it one or is it two? You, I, I think there's no realistic way you're going to be able to tell apart a super hypo caramel and a super caramel hypo. No way. You know, with the overlapping ranges of variation, it would just be too much of a mess. So I won't do any of that. And right. I. And when I got the first caramels, I brought those first ones over from Paul Jesus when he was back in Germany a long time ago, probably 15 years ago now. Uh, I purged my collection of anything that could make a red baby. So I don't have coastals that can make red babies. Some years later, I stumbled onto like, I had one female jag that could make kind of a very weak red baby. It was kind of like a dark brown baby. And I accidentally made a couple of red phase exa examples that were also red coastals from their very not spectacular line of red coastals apparently and i got rid of an adult female <laughs> just an adult female example <laughs> i was like i just don't want i don't want this money up the waters later at all but jeez so i don't know people will make their own decisions about what they want to breed and like i said the combination looks amazing it looks yeah. great yeah. some of the ones paul's made that are you know Super hot caramel hypos. They're ludicrous looking. I'm at, well, imagine, look at that yeah. super caramel I produced. Now, on top of that, it's also a hypo. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah it's amazing. But if you want to make amazing snakes that might be difficult to identify, if they're making you something that's amazing is the, the primary goal, um, then, yeah. But I won't, I won't do it. I have to be able to guarantee what things are. Um, uh, that makes sense. I mean, you know. Yeah, I, I didn't think about it from that point of view, but that you know, if you selling it, but uh yeah, they are fabulous looking. It's, Holy it's shit. a whole <laughs> you know this problem it, it <clears throat> extends to all sorts of we aspects have enough of like that in carpets. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Well, there's always those people and you see it in the carpets, or it doesn't matter what it is, you know, ball pythons, whatever, whatever subset of the hobby where I want to breed this pair of snakes. You put the pair of snakes together and the male doesn't do anything that you see. And so you go to plan B male. And then when the plan B male breeds mm -hmm. and you get eggs, you assume the plan B male is the father, but you don't know mm -hmm. that the original male didn't get a sneaky one in there some, at some point. And so this just leads to all manner of like potential problems. Oh, they're head albino. It's like, but are they? Because you had a non, you know. Yeah. He had a different animal in there. And just because you didn't see him do anything doesn't mean he didn't do anything. You have to be able to back it up or guarantee it. Yeah. You got to line up the boy and then that's the only male that goes with that female. And that's it. Yeah. It, it's, you, you <laughs> Win, lose, or draw. <laughs> like I'm like, it is killing me right now. I have three pairings that are going poorly and that nobody's doing anything. I am trying to breed. I have 1.2 hypo het exantics. 
the male is really borderline in size. The females are big enough. Uh, and I am trying to breed all these things. I do not want to breed hypo head exanthics together. The odds of making an exanthic super hypo, I haven't even fully quantified what does a super hypo even look like? What is that range of variation and what to look for? So trying to hit a one in 16 odds when one of those things is not well defined yet, mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. So I'm just trying to breed a proven male exanthic to the two female hypo heads and a hypo head exanthic male to a proven exanthic female and nobody's doing anything like nothing <laughs> nothing like I, you don't know how bad i want to just put a different male in there or something it's like uh, you know i could i could, well i've got a i've got a well i've got a a, a, a caramel tiger jag 100 head exanthic that would probably breed a piece of rope just <laughs> sitting there pacing around doing nothing nothing I yeah put nothing everyone to do. female and they would i guarantee i'd get a clutch but would they be exanthic would they be you know exanthic hypos or exanthic caramels i would not be able to be 100 percent certain unless it was a jag any non-jag offspring i would not be 100 yeah, there's a question mark yeah. and so how would i what would i do with those so i gotta just bite the bullet and not get the clutch and hope hope it gets better next year mm. So, yeah, it's, yeah, it's um, yeah i was thinking like think that uh do you think that ben uh ben moral could uh figure that out with rare genetic sync you just send sheds and start uh, doing it uh, make it much easier that's a yes and a no he in didn't. the sense that theoretically yes given enough time and motivation in the short term no because you don't know i mean as far as uh and Hopefully at the end of this month, when I start uh, posting up episodes of this podcast, I've been recording episodes up for the last few months, little by little. Uh, one of them is deals with that exact topic. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that is the genetic sequence, the ability to genetically sequence snakes and identify mutations. Um, but that really only mm -hmm. works if you know the address or the zip code at the very least of where that mutation would appear. You can't just, there's no test, just look for this random thing. It's like you have to know where you're looking right to know. and the ones that they've got developed tests for with ball pythons and things are because they're ones that have already been sort of identified from previous work and you know where to look if you know where to look for an albino the albino gene on the corn snake genome if you look in that same address on the ball python genome guess what it's basically in the same spot because gotcha. there's only so many places you can break that sequence of events genetically that will yield that result so if you know where it is in one species and you look in the same general area, you can usually find it in other species. So that's, uh, you know, but with things that are totally novel, like where would you look? You don't have an analogous mutation that you know the address of. Right. So it's not that it can't be done. It's just that it's a, it would be a lot more work. Uh, but to find one out. day, mm. uh, one day, yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I, it's just so much easier to like, plus I keep really good lineage records. Like that's kind of my thing. And if I don't, it doesn't look good if you got like a who's your daddy clutch. <laughs> like if yeah. you go on my website, <laughs> I have a family tree for every clutch of carpets I've produced since 2004. It's literally hundreds of clutches, hundreds. Some years there's like 35 or 40 clutches in a year. And there's this elaborate wow. family tree for all of them. And, and of all of that, there's exactly one who's your daddy clutch where I had to go to the... And it wasn't even like I did something weird. And like, that annoys him to this day. <laughs> like, yeah, it's hard to clean that. I had to make a line like in red so you could denote that it's possible this might be the father, but probably not, but it could be. And it was like two different male zebras. It wasn't like I put a Darwin in there. It was like just two different animals, you know, slightly different ancestry. So I don't like doing that. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's better than getting nothing, but... Uh, I really try to avoid that. I'll usually just opt for like, just roll the dice. I've got one of those clutches now, or maybe I'll get a clutch. I've got a, the best 75% ivory zebra pair I've ever produced. They oh. are white and they are zebras and they are, they look exactly like what you imagine what you think the best ivory zebra you could ever imagine would look like. That's what this pair looks like. And I haven't seen this male wow. do shit. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> In two years, I didn't see him do anything last year, and the female wasn't quite ready. Well, that she's ready this year, and it's the only female he's been with, and I haven't seen him do anything. They're always together, never breeding. And I've got a full blood ivory male just sitting here doing nothing, not pacing around, not getting 
not getting any females this year. And I'm like, ugh. if I put him in there, I know she'd go, but she's seems to be building. And I'm just, I've got to roll the dice and hope for it. Cause I got to know who the dad is. Well, it's just one of those things where it's like you think he, and, but then do you talk yourself into putting the same male up next year as now it's two years? Screw yeah, that, you, would be, that might be difficult if he's, you know, thwarted me a couple times. Yeah. yeah. We'll see. Um, I mean, th that Ivory Project goes back to 1994, so getting close to, geez, <laughs> 29 wow, years, wow. getting close to 30 years of dicking with that. And even the Ivory Zebra thing, that's like, 11 or 12 years ago made the first yeah, yeah. ivory zebras at 50 percent. so now to only just now have like ivory zebras that are actually white to put together to make an ivory super zebra which would probably be a train wreck but i almost have to try it i'm just like <laughs> i gotta i gotta i gotta see what that looks like i guess so, so. Yeah, yeah i was gonna yeah, ask that gonna about, ask the, about uh, the uh why is it why echoing is it now echoing? Owen? Mm -hmm. Mm. Oh, is yeah. Is it echoing now? No. No. It's it's on Nick's end. <laughs> yeah. Well then you're screwed. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to figure it out. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's just is it I can't hear anything. Still? It sounds fine on my end. It comes and it goes. Yes, I think. Uh, okay, now it's not there. Okay. Oh, Keep trying okay. to look up for this. Um, a tremendous number of people in the chat and I can't keep up with it. We just ignore them until something fun happens. Over there. <laughs> There's like whole I, side discussions going on too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't want to Thank say you. that was the issue. But yeah. Yeah, don't me. I'm a very good monotasker, but if you divide my attention, it just all falls apart. <laughs> we're, we're keeping an eye on it. So, so yeah, we were talking about that the other day that, um, you know, I haven't really seen the super zebra that we were promised back in 2009 that, you know, everybody had their hopes on this golden yellow, bling yellow, solid carpet python. It just seems that, I don't know, that project is sort of, it's got its own issues. Um, but I just don't know if we'll ever get to that. Do you think we'll ever, ever see that? I mean, it's come close, but not like what we see. Uh, I with don't think carpets. you'll ever get... I think that super zebras get a bit of a wash of sort of diffused melanin over the whole body. Uh, and that tends to give them an olivey green sort of cast. And I think that's what's suppressing that. I don't think you're ever going to get rid of that. I think you can selectively breed what's underneath to be brighter. And you see some, I've got an adult female I'm breeding right now. It's the best one I've ever produced. It's a yellow gold snake. It's not olivey green. It's not brown. It's not gray. It's, golden it's it's really nice for a super zebra but there's probably there's only so much yellow pigment something can have uh if you look at the best jungle carpets you see produced now and then you look at the best jungle carpets that were produced 25 years ago you'll notice that they're no better after a quarter century of refinement they look exactly the same they don't you get no better because fundamentally there's only so much you can only be so yellow you can't be more yellow. What would be more yellow? It'd be it'd be phosphorescent. It would have to glow in the dark to be more yellow. And that's just not a thing. I mean, you're not you can't selectively breed for bioluminescence. There, there some of these things are just neon, <laughs> just bright ass canary yellow, and that's the fullest extent of how yellow it's capable of being, and that's why they don't get more yellow. Yeah. Uh, I do wish the jungle carpet sort of uh contingent would explore other avenues of selective breeding other than just making more of the same more yellow more yellow <laughs> when you hit the wall before most of these guys were even in the car into the game you'd already hit the wall um and that's just uh you know why do we not have a really amazing neon yellow striped line of jungles that's selectively bred for striping which is Riley's working on it <laughs> is unfathomably easy i have completely striped darwin carpets my Darwin Tigers. It took me three generations, and they're stripe. They're better than most people's Thai coastals. Like it's, it's. It wasn't difficult. <laughs> it's carpets have no problem being striped. Mostly, you know, brettles and inlands not so much, but all the rest of them, yeah, it's not hard. You just keep going, just a few generations, and it nails it down pretty tight. But nobody does. Um, and so I'm a little surprised we don't have that. You see some of the Aussies have some really, like, it's it's really a wide yellow stripe. That's an amazing-looking phenotype. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So I wish people would get on that more. Me, well, I just try to make the yellow out of them, make them black. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> we were going to talk go. about that. Well, that, one, How's I've, that got project coming along? I've got a male that's substantially blacker than that. And uh, and he doesn't breed. This is year ah. three of him sitting there doing nothing. He just gets blacker, though. He's so black. I mean. Uh, that one? No, that's the fa- that is the father of them. That's their okay. father. Oh, okay. The offspring of him. Uh, and the male I've got is the is closer to the father than that female you put up. It is ridiculous. Um, they're probably the best two offspring that that snake produced. And uh, I just can't get that male to do anything so far. I thought I saw him spurring her the other day, so maybe. Who knows? Maybe he's part Darwin. I don't know. No, just kidding. I, I no, no. Yeah, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> too far, too far. I'm sorry. Dude, that's too, oh, so good day, sir. I have a question, Nick, because I'm curious with the, the you know, the melanistic IJs that I'm doing. Um, to, uh, they grow into that? Are they born normal and like slowly gain that melanin over time, or are they come out just they black? They gain and it. Uh, what you know? Is it a mutation? Uh, my guess is it's probably a polygenic sort of thing. Uh, melanistic mm-hmm. morphs in general are more likely to be melanistic in nature mm-hmm. than a single gene sort of a thing. There are tons of examples of single gene melanistic mutations. It's not like they don't exist. There's a bunch of them. But a lot of times a dark animal is just a dark animal and it's not a, indicative of a, a single gene mutation. Uh, I'm operating under that assumption, uh, but you never know. Uh, that seems to be the, the most likely scenario. Uh, they hatch out, the melanistic ones I have hatch out normal and gain dark pigment, but it's quick. Like, yeah, they started getting dirty almost immediately, like every shed. From the first shed on, there was already black tipping on the first shed and then it just keeps keeps going uh, yeah it keeps going and keeps filling in at the present rate by the time that male i have is five <laughs> or six years old he's gonna look just like his father or seven years old he's probably already five years old i just never feed him but uh, he'll be he just he's gonna be just filled in all black pretty much the real panther gene <laughs> thank you that didn't come out of a spray can panther phenotype yeah uh, uh, yeah well yeah. Yeah, uh, that whole uh, pants thing. And Eric and starts shit. reading and, his with you know, like, melanic I, I don't want to laugh. At I sort of have the same pop, problem. But... The males, the males won't breed. It's like they, mm-hmm. they, they breed, but it's hit or miss. So I don't know. Yeah, won't do nothing. This is, this is welcome to herpetoculture, I guess. This is <laughs> like I've got the number of projects. That, like I said, I've got like oh, one of the my best projects of the whole year. I've got three shots at it, and none of them are doing anything. Am I going to produce an exanthic hypo this year? I very much, I'd be quite surprised if they, if the male turns it around. It's really making me mad because the exanthic male I'm trying to breed to the two females is a proven breeder. It's like, come on, <laughs> you know what to do. Like, now, now there's no excuse. Like he produced the clutch last year with the exanthic female. I have the other one. They're both have produced together, and now I'm just breeding with other snakes, and nobody wants to do anything. Yep. So I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I'm curious, how has the sales of the book been? Have you noticed? The, are they? I mean, full disclosure, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Uh, I mean, I know like my observations and on that sort of subject are are just that. I don't know what the expectations of publishers are. I don't know what a fast selling book. What does that mean? What is the expect? Mm-hmm. I really don't know because I don't you know, publish books. It seems like it's sold fast. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. About. I think the at last count a couple months ago, over half of the entire print run was gone. Wow. wow. Okay. I think Justin and I alone sold nearly a quarter of like 20% of the entire print run before the book even came out. And now I think slightly more than half of the entire print run is sold in like three months or whatever that's been, uh, which seems like if you, if you, you know, you sp- print off what you think is five years worth of books and you sell half of them in three months, that seems like it's going well, but yeah. you'd also would expect that to be incredibly front loaded where there's demand and then a, most of them go out super fast. And then it's a trickle after that, which is what, what has happened. So I, I just don't know. I think good. Uh, I haven't, you know, Bob hasn't been complaining or anything. Yeah. So. I was just curious <laughs> if you saw an uptick as, as opposed to the last book, 
you know, when you did the first book to see if there was more people, you know, uh, into carpets, if you will. It's a little different uh, in that when the first one came out, I was really lax on the taking pre-orders and all of that. Um, so, I mean, Justin sold a lot of pre-orders the first time around and I did very little because I was just very late to getting that up and running and making, I didn't make much effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. This time I was actually much more proactive about that. So we both, you know, sold quite a few that way. So it seems like it was a lot more, but that's, I was more of an active participant uh, this time than in the previous couple books. So, I don't know. Uh, the second edition, so they printed about a thousand fewer copies than I think the first one. Uh, probably under the assumption that if everybody has the first one, that there'll be less people who want to buy the same book again or what they perceive to be the same book again. But it's you know, a completely different. <laughs> mm-hmm. book. It's a different book. <laughs> it's yeah. it bears almost no resemblance to the original book. Every picture is different. Yeah. All the everything's rewritten and it's double the size. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's going well. <laughs> but oh, good, good. <laughs> yeah, that's probably way to be to get a, a better answer. You know when you're when you're talking um, the like the the carpet python market, if you will. Uh, mm. I, me and Owen have been talking about we don't really see jet. Ja- I mean, you have like the gamma jags and stuff like that, but do you think that it doesn't seem that newer people coming into carpets are into that? You know, the loop de loop. You know, I got rid of all my jags. I know a long time ago when we were talking about it, you were sort of in that same ballpark where you're slowly starting to move away from that have you seen that happen in the market do you think that's right uh, yes uh not i mean people haven't completely abandoned it but i've definitely seen people move away from it i get very few mm-hmm. people asking me if i have any jag this or jag that mm-hmm. uh, once in a rare on rare occasion it happens but not not routinely um, I've had on occasions where I've had jags for sale the most common question i get is do you have any that aren't jags <laughs> that, well that i that, want that but not a jaguar uh, that super caramel <laughs> like that was from a clutch of super caramel jags half of them right. were jags and half of them were not and i made gotcha. the entire clutch just to keep back i lost my only female super caramel that wasn't a jag and then i still have a i have an, the most amazing super caramel tiger jag adult female that's many times proven Mm-hmm. Uh, it's absolutely it's like burnt orange it's the craziest looking most awesome looking snake but she's goofy and you know all loopy now in her old age she's laid a bunch of clutches so she's retired she's you know just sitting around not bre- being bred and then when the her sister who had you know gotten kind of long in the tooth also uh mm-hmm. i lost her i needed to i don't want to go back to the process of having to reprove out what's a super caramel and what's not so out of necessity i you know brought her out of retirement made one clutch and to keep back uh, <laughs> to keep back a couple of female super caramels that weren't jags and i ended right. up with 22 babies and only one female super caramel that wasn't a jag. yeah yeah that's about right <laughs> <laughs> lots of male super caramels that weren't jags and lots of female super caramel jags but it just the way it broke down it just there's only the one and that's that's the one so i held her back not because she showed some extraordinary sort of potential just because she was literally the only the only one, one. <laughs> just, yeah i still have a super caramel jag female from that clutch that's just well you know you guys know you breed snakes uh you get those animals do you get you probably each have that like sort of rogues gallery of i don't know what i'm gonna do with this snake yeah uh, several <laughs> yeah oh my God, i yeah. probably yeah. have 10 <laughs> snakes that i just wish someone would just Give, I could give these things to somebody. Like I have a few that I have no idea what the, what to do with them. Yeah, I ended up with like I've got a I've got a an amazing hypo sixty six percent het genetic striped brettles python that is obviously a het. It's mostly striped. It's awesome. It's a twenty twenty. But when it first hatched, it had what appeared to be like a mild inverted kink in its back, and I wrote mm. kink on the front of the label. After six months, the kink was not there anymore. In fact, after the first day, I never saw it again. But I really, I tried to find it about six months later. This is two years ago. That snake has no discernible kink whatsoever. But I never sell it because I don't, I know I saw something. I wouldn't have written that for no reason. Right, like, right. There had to be something. <laughs> right. But like had a defect that prevented me from selling it. And then now it doesn't. But I don't know what to do with it. So it just sits here. Yeah, I've got that super caramel jag female. If you think that super caramel looks amazing, that jag female has not a speck of dark pigment. It looks like some kind of albino. It's insane. 
but it's wow. just a terrible eater. It's, it's <laughs> terrible. It eats enough to not die and barely grow at all. It's just, I would just give it to somebody. Just they could just have it, and like, <laughs> didn't have to take care of it anymore. Uh, and, you, know, you get those. I got a zebra from 2020 like that. It was from my best clutch of zebras. Like this thing is. It's just awful. That's what Eric did. He dropped, he dropped like, off a bunch of snakes in boxes off at my house. Like, these are your problem I did. now. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> you figure it out. <laughs> it's like, I've got a 2020 zebra that is like over two years old and it looks like a two month old snake. Like, it's oh, just, God, I hate that. <laughs> it'll eat, no. it'll eat yeah. enough to not die, basically. It's healthy. Nope. It's fine. But it's like this thing, I don't, I don't want this. That's I my, can't sell it. That's, it comes, yeah. What do you do with it? Right. That's my Cape York male. I can't, I don't know what it is. The thing is just like I'm just like oh, he hates that's why I was saying to you I need Cape <laughs> like, York male because I'm done with this one. I don't you know, know. I had like, like eight point a clutch of like eight point four. So I got you covered. Don't worry about it. <laughs> okay, beautiful. <laughs> almost all boys. Like I'm like uh, yeah. yeah like, lots of you... lots of extra males. After after the show, like let me know which one you want. I'll put your name on the best one. So you, we'll figure it out later. Nice. Um, <laughs> I, know, I know. I know. Don't want to breathe. <laughs> yeah, I know yeah, Owen. Yeah, no Owen's still working with Jags and Riley. He's yep. he just bought this super reduced Tiger Jags. So there's people out there, and I'm glad that they're still doing it. You know, but like I just see as a whole that the carpet python world seems to have uh, not. I mean, I, and it could be. It could be the perspective of you know when we were in back in the day, early as the carpet pythons. There was what Jag tiger and granite right yeah, like i mean in the beginning three. yeah you know yeah. there wasn't really like so everything had to be jack you know yeah, oh, yeah. i mean there's <laughs> even that the class class. Then, <laughs> then they had to be jack too. Species, like they were morphs <laughs> yep yeah yep. ij jags and jungle jags so we just don't have enough morphs um <laughs> I guess, and you see the same thing happen with ball pythons. Like nobody, like the spider morph, which is the exact same mutation. Right. In ball in ball python land, like not only it's literally like a net negative. Like if you had, you know, a comp morph combo, and it would be worth twenty five dollars. If you had add one additional gene and it's spider, it becomes worth twenty dollars. It actually has negative value. Not only does it not add anything, it actually removes value because people just don't want it. Right. Um, so I, it's not quite like that with carpets, but I have only, what do I have? I have three Jags. Three. Oh, that's it. Wow. Okay. I have a Caramel Tiger Jag head exanthic male uh, who I wish wasn't a Jag, but he's a, my ratio is just a Caramel Tiger head exanthic. I needed him for that reason. That's actually one I produced and sold. And then sometimes you find yourself needing a sake to fill a hole in the lineup and you end up buying back a thing you produced years earlier. <laughs> like, That's so a I kick in the it. pants. Like, I, that. I bought it back. Like, <laughs> well, it's great for me because I don't have to worry about its ancestry. I already have its ancestry. True. All all right, yeah. right there. I've got everything, all its records still. So I bought that one back, not because it was Jag, but because it was an exam a caramel head exanthic. And a tiger. Um, I have an exanthic uh, caramel jag. So I have okay. a caramel jag female that I is the first one I'd ever produced, and I didn't want to keep it, but the damn thing was just so amazing to look at. I just couldn't make myself sell it. Like I didn't want to keep it because the jag, like it just looks so awesome. It was like gray and pink and just amazing. And like I have to keep this snake. And it just it ate on the first try, and I was just hooked. It's like, all right, you can stay. <laughs> Never missed a meal, grew like crazy. I never fed it, it would just grow anyway. It was perfect. <laughs> it's like it's always what we growing. wanted. Yeah. <laughs> and so I've got that one, and I've got the retired super caramel jag, and that's it. Who's retired? Yeah. Um, yeah, I <clears throat> um I did get this question from uh, Greg Cooper too. Um uh, he said, let's see, I don't mind that many people are introduced to snake keeping with ball pythons, but do you feel, does Nick feel that the number of people interested in the lesser known species is growing or declining? What thoughts does he have on how to increase interest in them? I guess carpets would be kind of maybe. No, don't, don't increase um, interest. Get out, get away from my weird fringe species. Get, get go, go play on the other side of the sandbox. <laughs> you know? uh, 
it's always like a double-edged sword. Like you can bring up a bunch of positive things that have come about because of the ball python sort of phenomenon, and you can also bring a you know bring up a bunch of pretty negative things that it's that it's caused. It's not. It's a mixed mm. bag. Uh, has it brought more people into the hobby? Absolutely. The hobby has grown exponentially, big, and that's been the single biggest driver of that. Uh, but it's also sort of cheap in the hobby in a way. And that it has created a mindset in the hobby that the only thing that matters is morphs. It's the only thing that matters. Nothing. Why would you even have a snake that doesn't have morphs? Why would it even, what's the point of being alive? If you're not a morph, why would you even be alive? What's the well, point? Why like, feed I, it? I, I yeah. like, you know, ridiculous. Like I have an inland carpet for sale. It's like, Oh, I thought about getting into inlands, but you know, there really aren't any morphs. So what are you supposed to do with them? It's like, you know, what do you mean? <laughs> Inlands are awesome. Are. Like it, yeah. A morph is not an improvement. It's just a novelty, basically. It's like a different, yeah. you know, it's a novelty paint job difference, really, mm -hmm. for the most part. And it's not an improvement. It's just different. It's not better than. It's just different than. And it, it's created this perception that that is the only thing that matters in the hobby. And it's probably the thing that matters the least in the hobby. So now we have a this paradox where people are obsessed with something that doesn't really matter much. Uh, and they kind of lose sight of the things that I think do matter. So that's not a positive development, but yeah, a lot more people have come into the hobby as a result of it. Um, yeah. We talk about that a lot that inlands don't get no love. Like Brett will seem to get some love, you know, I but like, I keep trying to get him some love. I keep promoting. Them. Yeah. You're the guy, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're the guy when it comes to the Brettles. I mean, Banging I just drum, I, yeah. I was looking at your Facebook page, like to just pull up those pictures that I got, and I'm just like looking at this these the lines of just Brettles. <laughs> like you know, when you click on photos on Facebook, it's just glowing red Brettles after one, yeah, after yeah. the other, after the other. I'm like, holy shit! Yeah, you should be proud they're of like, that one. Man. They're like a python that's designed to be somebody's pet. They're basically yeah. indestructible. Yeah. Super temperature tolerant, as docile as any ball python, only they get better looking with age. Instead of turning brown, they turn red and they get mellower with age and they're interesting and they actually move and do stuff. They're awesome. They're they're yeah. the perfect. And you gotta drop a rock on it python. to kill it. Yeah, no, I love them. It's yeah. like <laughs> I recommend I get a lot of people that want their first carpet python and they've come from, you know, whatever other area of the hobby. And that's why I always try to steer them with towards one of those. It's like, look, you, you have a snake. You're never going to worry about it. biting you. you smell reaching there and grab it and interact with it. And it's going to display. It's not going to be shy. It's going to get better looking with age. And you could probably leave it in the refrigerator overnight. It'd probably be fine. Like I Ray tech temp gun. My brettles pythons are in brumation the other day. It was 46 degrees. <laughs> 46. Yeah, they're fine. They're looking like they want to eat something. They're moving around like 46 degrees. Yep. Uh, yeah. Lucas said in 20 years, he's going to have the uh, the whole uh, red inland thing going. I said, I don't know if I'll be around in 20 years. Right? Hurry up, Lucas. <laughs> Lucas. Lucas said he's going to selective breed uh, the red and inlands. And I said, in 20 years, he's going to have it. I said, I don't know if I'll be alive in 20 years, man. And it's possible. I hope so. right? Any of those sort of carpets are so phenotypically plastic that you can selectively breed just about anything you you could think of. You could do given enough time. Uh, you just have to be willing to do things like make a clutch of babies and raise all of them for three years to figure out which ones gain the most uh, that red pigment. If you're willing mm -hmm. to do that, you'll make good progress. People they think they're in. They think they start a selective breeding project and they don't. And that they think what that what they do is they breed two snakes together and they have a desired sort of look that they're shooting for. And then they hold back one or two snakes from that clutch. It's like, no, you 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 hold back a lot of snakes and then you thin it down later as you they color up and you kind of see where things go. Carpets, their ontogenic color change is two things happen. As they mature, they gain additional rounds of black pigment distribution and mm -hmm. also yellow pigment. That yellow pigment is what makes your jungle carpet turn from gray to yellow and also what makes the black tipping. That's the end of the color change. In a Brettles python, those yellow pigments manifest themselves as the red pigment you see as they get older. And so if you're trying to selectively breed for, you know, red, yellow, brown, any of those tones in a carpet python, you need to wait till they've had their ontogenic color change to see how much they gain. You can't right. figure it out just by looking. Mm -hmm. 
you know, pattern right. characteristics you can totally pick right out of the egg. But color, you got to be patient. And it's if you want reasonably fast results, you you know, I'll do I'll hold back eight or ten for a year and then cut it down to like six. And then, you know, then I think I'm going to tell myself I'll cut it down to the best pair at a year later. And then I never do. And then I have a million adults because I. <laughs> Because I start thinking like logically, which is not what I need to do. It's like, well, I put this much time into it. Like, I have a, I have a granite, a female granite, sixty-six percent hexanthic that is obviously hexanthic, and it's like a two and a half year old snake. It's a sub adult. It's eating medium rats. I'm like, yeah, I don't need this. Like, why did I hate to pull this back? What am I doing? It's the most inefficient way to do anything. Like selling things you've raised three quarters of the way to adulthood. <laughs> Bring it right up to that line and then get rid of it. Yeah. So I realized, like, what am I doing? Like, I literally have in my exanthic granite project, I literally have an exanthic granite male that is a really good breeder. I have a granite that's a pos head exanthic that looks like an exanthic granite. He's that visual and he breeds. I've got a het granite. I've got three visual granites. I've got an exanthic granite and a double head exanthic granite and an exanthic. And it's just, it's too many. Why do I need that many snakes in one project? Right. Well, I think I'm going to get a clutch out of an Exanthic pop when I got from you, Eric. Oh, nice. shit. Bred nice. to an Exanthic granite. So a whole clutch of Exanthics, 100% het granite. Nice. nice. Great ovulate. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully a good eggs. But I like the Exanthic pop ones quite a bit. Yeah, I do yeah. too. Uh, much better than the, I had bad luck with the Coastals. Uh, I'm I just this close to giving up on the Exanthic Coastals. Really? Come oh, yeah. to the dark side. They're Alan. gone. They're Come gone. The I, the, my female has this. This I've been trying to get this one female to breed for like five years, and she's my my het. And I'm like, will you please? And I've all thing, all manner of exanics over the years, and this is the this is the last year, and then I'm done. I'm gonna just. I have a whole. Caramel. I have a whole clutch of exantic granix, except I think I gave one to Jason. And other than that, I think I might have sold maybe one other one. And I just, I don't know. No, <laughs> you Dude, I, you, you have those? Give them to no, me. No, 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 I will. No. I'm sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. I said that wrong. Hat, 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 hat. Okay. Double hats. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I would take some double hats. I could play with IJs, you know. Please let me it's back. Double hats this year. I made a few more double visuals. I did make like 1.5 Exanthic. 100% het granites. I made no granites that were het exanthic, but I have like five female exanthics that are 100% het granite. <laughs> so, cool. so I kept a couple of them. But of course I did. Um, speaking That's of whatever, you got other ones I've got that I've been raising up for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is an amazing carpet morph, man. It has to be one of the top ones. Besides the, I was really impressed with the stripe hypo stuff, and the and that stuff is amazing. The the hypo tigers, but the exanic granite, man, they are, they are nice. I think my two favorite carpet morphs, if you consider brettles, are probably the full blood hypo stonewashed and the exanthic granites. I think both of those are. They couldn't be more different in terms of color, but uh, I think those are just two about the most extreme things. Uh, yeah, I, I wish the exanthic granites were a little easier to make. I'll get there though. I'm getting there. <laughs> uh, I'm getting yeah. there. But they, they tend to, yeah, that double recessive stuff takes a minute to make any numbers of. So, can you, we did get this question. Can you go over the meaning of 50% versus 100% hypo stonewash? Yes. Okay. Uh, I saw that Lori asked that. Uh, basically, yes. that's just the most. That's my way of denoting what you're getting, basically. And I think it's the most honest way to represent that. Um, hypo and Brettles pythons is complicated. It's like if I gave everybody a pen and paper and said, here, write the most convoluted, confusing thing you could possibly imagine, that's pretty much what it would be. It's just to explain it to people, it's difficult. I wish it was anything in the world but what it is, but it is, in fact, what it is. And that is that it is basically simultaneously a single gene mutation and a polygenic thing in the sense that it is not strictly a single gene mutation but there is a single gene at its core so imagine if you have like a full blood hypo the full deal not undiluted from hypo to hypo back ad infinitum since the dawn of time uh, and you assume that uh, 
you know that it's a polygenic thing and there's more than one gene that contribute to it. After 15 years of doing things like holding back whole clutches for seven years of their adults and seeing how they go at various dilutions and figuring this out, what it seems to be is that it's a small number of genes, probably about four-ish. Could be three, could be five, probably can't be much less or much more than three or five. It's in that, so four, for the sake of explanation, the math works out easier, just easier to talk if we assume it's four genes. But if you have a polygenic trait that there are four genes that are responsible for contributing to that phenotype, it's tempting to assume that all of them are doing 25% each, but that's never how it works. In this case, imagine, if you will, a scenario where you have one gene that's the core hypo gene that is doing about 50% of the work, and the other three genes cumulatively are doing the other 50%. So it's very weighted towards one gene. There is a core hypo gene. And then the other stuff sort of is globbed on at the end, and that the combination of all those things creates that phenotype. Um, now, the second level of complexity to that is that there's two different types of black pigment in all these snakes. There is the base layer of pigment that is black pigment that's present when the snakes hatch, and that is governed by you know the genes that it's governed by. And then you have a second round of pigment that comes in with age uh, when they go through the ontogenetic color change. You have that second round of black pigment distribution. That appears to be governed by different genes than the base layer. So what you have is a situation where the primary core gene for the hypobretals knocks out that base layer of black, the gene that controls that base layer of black pigment that's present when they hatch. And they're all dominant or incomplete dominant. It's very murky whether it's dominant or incomplete dominant. But suffice to say that if you have one copy of that base gene or if you have two, you hatch out and are visually hypomelanistic. You can tell the ones that have, so you can tell, right, if you have a clutch that's mixed, you can tell ones that at least got that present that base gene. You can you can see that they look different uh, than the ones that didn't. But that doesn't tell you if they got the genes that come in later. The other genes, the other we'll say three genes, combine to suppress the later round of black pigment distribution that happens when they go through a color change. Anybody that's kept brettles by those, oh, and you know, they I gain do. dark pigment on the tail on the on the ass end when they started about three four feet long and start getting thicker black bands on the tail. Yep. The other genes in the hypo suppress that later round of black pigment distribution. And if you have all of those genes, you have an animal that starts out with very little black pigment and finishes with very little pigment. So where the 50%, 75%, this sort of stuff comes into play is how much you have diluted that. If you okay. assume that the original founding hypos were homozygous, they were, I hate the term, I'm starting to move away from the term super because it's frankly not very scientific. But they're the really can't imagine why. Yeah, <laughs> like, I think it goes back to Kevin McCurley, and so that alone <laughs> the reason to quit saying it. But uh, uh, so it, we, we already had words for these things. Why did you need to make new ones? I, because <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, it was obviously to sort of dumb it down, but I don't think you do people any favor by dumbing things down, do you? I think no, no. Oh homozygosity versus heterozygosity is not that complicated. I think people can handle the they correct teach middle school biology. We can figure it we out. Don't need, we don't need, we're not toddlers. I think people can handle the right term. So if you're operating the assumption that the original hypos were homozygous for all four of these genes, okay. i.e. the quote unquote super of all of genes, when you breed a full blood hypo that is homozygous for all of these genes to a non hypo, you basically made a quadruple heterozygote. It's heterozygous for all of those genes. But since all of those genes are incomplete dominant, they look visually really hypo. Mm -hmm. When I bred the first, did this the first time, I bred the original hypo male to uh, genetic striped female from a totally unrelated bloodline. And I was astounded that the babies looked, uh, there were 16 babies and I raised all of them for seven years. And I never even bred half of them. I raised, I sent Paul half of that clutch as adults just so i didn't have to feed them or house them anymore did all the work. well i wanted to know and i'm glad i did because hmm. the obvious most people what they would have done is like oh the the 50 watered down hypos looked exactly the same and were utterly and completely indistinguishable from the full blood hypos they looked exactly the same for almost a year they looked the same 
Most people would just start selling them and say, oh, it's obviously dominant or incomplete dominant or dominant because they mm -hmm. look just like the. But what happened is since they only had one of each of those genes and not were homozygous for any of them, when they went through their color change, they gained substantially more black. It varied quite a bit, but a lot of them gained a lot more dark pigment than the average on the back end of their color change than, an, than a full blood hypo typically would have. There's always ranges of you know variation and overlap but uh those animals as adults at 50 percent the best one looks to this day i still have him i don't breed him anymore but he looks like a full blood hypo and the worst one looked like a glorified normal most of them were in the middle of that definitely better better lighter and brighter with less back pigment than a normal would have but not what a full blood hypo would typically have Mm -hmm. But you had to raise them for a couple, three years before you could really see that color change flat and that additional black pigment come through. Uh, so when I say a 50% hypo, this really is complicated because there's another layer beyond this that makes it even more confusing. But uh, I'm talking about the percentage of hypo blood there is, and you can use that as a proxy for some sort of expectation as to what to expect visually. Okay. Um, if there's eight potential alleles for at four different locuses, you could have eight alleles possibly. You could be homozygous for all four. A fifty, a first generation fifty percent hypo can only have four. Mathematically, can only have four. You can't have any more than that. Hmm. Uh, now, when you breed a fifty percent to a fifty percent, a hypo het stripe to a hypo het stripe to make hypo stripes. Theoretically, you're still at fifty percent hypo blood because you bred fifty percent to fifty percent divided by two, you're still at 50%. However, at that point, two things happen. You can return to a state of homozygosity at any one of those four places. And you can also lose the hypo allele at any of those four places in equal measure. So you, what you find is the first generation hypos that are outcrossed are very consistent. They all look really awesome. And then they get older and gain more dark pigment. The 50% okay. to 50%, some of them statistically would actually be a full hypo again, and some would be a completely normal again. The odds of that are extremely low, though. It's like it's like 64 to 1 odds you'd have one that got, was homozygous for all eight or all mm -hmm. four genes or whiffed on all four genes entirely. But it's possible. So what you see is you'll have like a – they'll diverge into two camps. You basically end up with about two-thirds of the snakes are obviously hypomelanistic to some degree or other, and about one-third are not. But yeah. even that is only a measure of did they inherit any copies of that base gene that knocks out that base layer of pigment. And when you breed 50%, a heterozygous, two heterozygotes for an incomplete dominant gene that does that, you'd exactly expect that two thirds of them would get, you know, 50% of them would get one copy, one out of four would get two copies, and one out of four would get no copies. And that's pretty much what you see. Mm -hmm. You can't really tell apart which one got two copies versus the ones that got one at that age, but you can tell, definitely tell the one that didn't. And that's how you know that that's what's that. And the ones that don't hatch out, particularly hypomelanistic, usually the statistical probability that you whiffed on all the genes that come in later is, remote, is extremely remote. They probably got a little something, something on the back end. So you end up with these animals that, uh, you know, are not what you'd call a hypo, but they will end up curiously good looking later. They'll end up a little <laughs> bit nicer than you would otherwise expect. I've made a bunch of genetic stripes that are like that, that are like, well, they're not hypo stripes because they whiffed on that base gene, but they clearly got a little something on the back end. So they end up a little bit redder than your typical stripe would end up, but not something you could in good conscience call a hypo. Gotcha. Uh, so calling it a five percent, you know, you, that's the percentage of, of the hypo blood that's in there. And I, what I want is for people to have a realistic expectation of what to expect. There are people out there, and I knew it was going to happen when it got confusing, that are like, they just like, oh, it's a hypo brettles. It's a hypo brettles. It's like, is it? It's like if you've got, you know, 50% hypo, hypo blood, and then you breed that hypo to something that isn't a hypo, at that point, you're at only 25%. You might at most have, what, one half a copy of something? I mean, maybe... Mm -hmm. That's an animal's not going to have the same potential as a higher percentage animal would because it the probability of inheriting more of those alleles and giving you a more bold phenotype goes down every time you do that. And so right. that's what that is. It's the best way I could come up with, but everything we come up with is always somewhat imperfect, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Um, 
the other question we had is what are so I, I think I yeah I sent this to you. what what are your thoughts on providing UV for carpet pythons? Yeah, I mean obviously there's a difference between people bre breeding them and 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 keeping them as pets or whatever. Diamond pythons have UV for, but I don't know if, if you had any thoughts on. I don't do it, and I have absolutely no intention of starting to do it. I don't think there's mm -hmm. any real objective evidence that would suggest that there's any benefit from it. However. I will also say that there's no way it's going to make things worse. And the technology, yeah. the equipment is pretty cheap. So if you're not doing any harm, if there, you know, just because there's no, you know, definitive evidence that shows there's any benefit in doing so, it doesn't mean there isn't a benefit. It just means that no one studied enough to find that benefit. It's possible that there is some tangible benefit yeah. of doing it that no one's really quantified. And you're certainly not doing any harm. So if you're not doing any harm, you know, if you got diamonds, but you got some expensive snakes like diamonds, like, is it going to really hurt you to put a $50 light bulb on them? Not really. No. There is one benefit that is tangible, though, and that is that snakes look different under full spectrum lighting. <laughs> they look more natural. They do. And it's like, so, you know, your, your own, even if it's just your own personal viewing pleasure as you look in this beautiful cage of this beautiful snake and it looks more natural and maybe it enhances how it looks to you visually because of the spectrum of light you're putting on it. That's probably worth a $60 light bulb. So yeah. you're, not, you're, not, you're certainly not hurting them, but until I see some real, you know, something through peer review that shows there's some actual physiological benefit, then, you know, at that point, I guess I'm buying a lot of light bulbs. But, <laughs> there's but been there's some papers. Kind of predator, so, well, not dying. No, let me, let me throw this back at you because this was uh there was a youtube video that i was watching on and they were talking about some some papers that were um uh did that studied uv and snakes right not necessarily carpet pythons but they talked about the nocturnal like people think that you don't have to and this doesn't necessarily have to do with uv but more of a light cycle right is that there's certain um like we have certain hormones that kick in when the sun comes up to wake us up and get us going and then to get us to put us to sleep when the sun goes down. Right. And in nocturnal animals, it's just the opposite. So if you're doing a, that light cycle, then they're not, they're, they made it seem like they were living in daylight all the time. If you're not giving them light or if you're giving them a light cycle. Uh, I think everything should have a light cycle. I think mm, that's right. probably absolutely true. Uh, just like you're, uh, it's like you you may have worked a graveyard shift in your life, or you certainly have known yes. people that have. It's like you're, they're constantly fighting against their own biology. It's like your brain is wired to sleep when it's dark and be awake when it's light. It's like, you ever like drive all night, like from a long road trip and you drive all through the night without sleeping and you should be totally tired and the sun comes up and you suddenly aren't as tired anymore, even yeah. though you've been up for 24 hours driving back from California. This happens to me when the sun comes up, all of a sudden I feel like I've rejuvenated, even though I haven't rested because of that. <laughs> like, that's a thing. It would stand to reason that they would have something similar. Uh, they're not supposed to be active all the time. And if it's reversed, then it's reversed. But I think, you know. I have cage lights in every cage has lights in it. I have tubs that have lights in them. Not every tub, but I have room right. lights and the room lights are on and the room lights are on a timer. So I program in the photo period for all of my adult snakes and my baby room. The lights are on the room, whether I, I turn the light on when I go in, it's all automatic. Mm -hmm. I can turn it off manually if I need to, you know, cause a lot of times you do better feeding things in the dark when they're first, you know, fussy little babies, but I, right. I everything needs a photo period. Yeah, I think I, I don't know when I was first coming into it, it seemed like the well, I don't know with well, the people that I were, was talking to. I think this was even before I started talking to you. They said photo periods for carpets was just bullshit. And you don't need to do it and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, uh, the more I think snakes are that group of reptiles that have sort of like not, um, you know, uh, nobody has really studied in depth the care like we we keep them and they they live and, you know, maybe there's more to it than 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 what meets the eye you know yeah um, it, it, i mean it's just because what you're doing works doesn't mean you can't do something that would work better yeah, uh, yeah. just because if you're only you know 
if if things eat, grow, and breed and reproduce successfully, if that's your benchmark for success, which is not irrational to think that. I mean, yeah, some of these sort of ancillary things may not be completely necessary, but it doesn't mean you should discount them entirely. It's mm -hmm. Um, I have seen in my own collection behaviors from snakes that, you know, I mean, there is a trend, unfortunately, in the hobby now where people anthropomorphize a bit too much about this stuff. And they sort of in, in, imbue these animals with a bit more cognitive ability than they pretty clearly have in a lot of cases. Uh, you know, your snake doesn't really get bored. It does, that's not a thing. They don't have bored. That's not a thing the brain processes. Your snake has not bored. It's also not happy to see you because they don't they don't really do happy or sad either for that matter. It's like, but they are capable of a little bit more than we think, probably. Right. So I think as a keeper that it is our responsibility to meet the needs of the animals we choose to keep. They didn't choose to live in a box at your house. You chose to right. have them live in a box at your house. Yeah. <clears throat> right. It's a responsibility to give them a decent quality of life. People will argue endlessly about what that means, but I think that's the basic uh, you know, uh, gist of it. It's like to give these animals a decent quality of life. Uh, like I said, I give everything a photo period, always have. Mm -hmm. I've got cages. Like, why would I want a bunch of dark cages? Like, it's yeah, so, no. <laughs> so easy to get little, like, I see them little, coming from the dark. No, I have like little, like, hockey puck LED lights. They're like a quarter of an inch thick. They're these little, and they just like stick to the ceiling. And they're so easy to wire up. Like, why would I want to see the snake? It's easier to clean the cage, even if I didn't want to see this. It's like, it's. Mm -hmm. It's just better. Why <laughs> wouldn't you put lights in the cage? Whether right. I have UV lights or something, like you can argue whether yeah, you could debate that, necessary, that. But it's like at least sure. a photo period. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, you know. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. I was gonna say uh, I forgot this. Lucas had a question. He just said <laughs> to the Brettles thing. Uh, with this complex structure, how did we get here? Is the Brettles hypo just the product of selective breeding? I don't mm. think he was paying attention. <laughs> I don't think he was listening. Yeah. I'm a little disappointed. Lucas should know better. I talk to him all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I've literally sent this man like 50% hypo blood animals on breeding loan that he's bred twice. He doesn't now. even know what he has. <laughs> <laughs> Two years. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm oh, him. Lucas. Yeah. No, it's. His question is being. I don't under. Not an, that's that's unfortunate for him. It's not a. It can't be a situation of just purely of selective breeding. It, you uh, could argue or not necessarily argue, but you could debate whether or not those other alleles, in particularly the three that come in on the back end, that contribute to a hypo, were those separate individual mutations that have aggregated to this point on here. Or were those just alleles that were in the Brettles Python gene pool more generally in captivity, and they just accumulated via selective breeding? You know, I don't think you didn't have a series of mutations occurring in the hobby or whatever that yielded this, but it's like they could have been, you know, natural alleles floating around that when you get them all lined up in the right animal, you end up with those. At least some of them. the base layer gene one, I doubt very much, but that would be the case. But um okay uh owen anything mm. else that you want to hit on before we jump over to the patreon i'm good i mean i i'm just like just you know eating it all and every you know yeah. getting it all in the head and yeah just sitting here and i'm like the inner carpet coastals are out of here let's get me some exanic <laughs> granites in here and i'll fail at breeding ijs <laughs> further so you can't breed IJs. I have net. He can't we've do been, it. The, we've been. This has been a twelve-year thing. We've done. You've been disappointed for in, in me for this. Well, fact. I assumed you'd just done you it at that time. No, somewhere, I just, no, it's just constant failure. It's like it just, But they're the easiest one. I only had one pair, so <laughs> I'm saying, I listen. I know I set myself up for failure. You only, only need one pair. They are literally probably the only carpet that is so easy to breed. You can breed them on accident. I. You well, can I mean... accidentally breed them. <laughs> yeah, because bred white I, pythons. I just and not... haven't gotten the I, IJs, and then I'll I, try again. I yeah. cycle everything way later than everybody else. I'm just now starting to see females that are starting to like lay on their side and build towards ovulation. And there's like six carpets that are good, that are clearly going to go. There'll be mm -hmm. more, but the first six, five of them are IJs. <laughs> it's always that way. It's like, yeah, of course you are. 
Of course. I couldn't like I mean I couldn't let Eric I mean he's that's his thing. I can't step on his toes. Now uh, he yeah, agreed, I'll take it. for your benefit, just not confuse you. So <laughs> yeah, come on, man. You can't be you can't be a white lip python breeder and not I so can. And it just guess. defies all I so can. Because <laughs> here like I am. Lips, like literally <laughs> the southern white lips are sympatric with them. Like they're literally in the same place. Like like you're doing <laughs> you know a mate selective pain in the ass to breed species and one's the easiest thing in the world then you're just like and i go to the white lips but not the left or right and i went right yeah <laughs> so it's... i mean yeah i mean i've not bled southern white lips myself yet so i mean you got that one on me uh, for sure. my, minor minor oh. northerns so they're the oh ones. i thought you bred southerns too no well working on it but northerns oh, right now Yep. Uh, I hate white lip pythons. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, Nick. I hate them so Beautiful much. Beautiful snakes. Nasty but... ass. <laughs> Un, I mean, why? I laugh my ass off every time I see people ooing and eyeing and like that, that became the must have it snake. It's like, yeah, that is so annoying. You gotta be so disappointed more. when they get one. They spend all this money and it's just going to piss on them and bite them and just be nasty. And oh my God. Worse than that, people are, people are. Are, are eating up Timor pythons. And I'm like, do you really want that thing? Because, like, you touch that thing and it just sprays it just on you, yeah. this everywhere. Like, why I would you do this? Stuff. Yeah. Didn't I send you my original black white lips? You did. You when did. I got the last ones I got angry at and frustrated with that I sent you. <laughs> many, many moons ago, yes. And the male was Captain Bread from yeah. Matt Turner and it was horrible. Yeah, it was Captain Bread and it was just nasty. Nasty thing. I've got some. I've got a pair again that Ryan produced in different years, and they're like sub adults, and they're horrible too. Like I've got a, I've got a, a group of gold white lips that are catch red. That Ryan literally lives like a mile, not a mile, like an hour drive. So I have gold catch red gold ones from Ryan, and they're freaking terrible. No, oh, all mine are horrible. All those babies horrible. are evil. Yeah. The only way I can even clean them. I never feed them anything but tiny, tiny feed because every week when I got to clean them, I have to do the clean and feed where you like give them a little tiny rat. And while they're just killing that rat, that you're <laughs> you the rat change the water because it's like, because God help you. If you try to just get in there without that distraction, like, I mean, you're bleeding. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. It's like, why are oh, why man. every time I got to interact? I'm like, why do I have you? Why are you here? <laughs> why do I do this to myself? Like the damn Tanabar pythons or something, I insist on keeping. It's like because you're gonna just check it off the list, and be, when you finally get the eggs, you're gonna be like, "Yes, done. Get I'm out." Pretty, like I've heard Tanabar pythons multiple times. No, not them. The white lips. So just check it, and then you get rid I, of them. I probably yeah. will. I don't know. I, it's like I've got to do it just because I can't let Ryan totally show me up on that. <laughs> yeah, but... I, I have known Ryan for almost thirty years. Like I've known that guy since I was a newbie dipshit in the hobby. And he was the guy that worked at one of the local pet shops and I sold, bought, sold me crickets. Like, literally, I've known him since we were both a couple of just dingling hobbyists with a couple of snakes, didn't know what we were doing or talking about. And I've just right. grown up in the hobby with Ryan. So it's, we have a, a friendly rivalry, but he's one of my closest friends. But So I'm like, ah. Oh. He's like, the list of things I've bred that he hasn't bred has gotten small, but the list of things he's bred is he's gaining ground on me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he crushed it last year. Holy yeah, shit! Yeah, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta talk to him when it gets warm. I want to send that ring python out to him, and uh, we gotta swap white lips, him and I. So you know, oh, okay. one thing that's like I've been doing this a long time. I bred a ton of stuff, but you can always learn from somebody else. There's always oh, God, yeah. the older I get, and the when I was younger, I thought I knew everything, and now I just like the more I actually know a lot of stuff, the more I realize how much stuff I don't know. It's like the more you know, the more you realize the insurmountable amount of stuff you'll never know. <laughs> and so, yes. you, and so oh, what's that called? There's a curve on that. I convince myself I know everything about breeding pythons, but I don't. So, like, I'm I'm trying to breed Burmese pythons and had a hell of a time the last couple of years. So I've I've taken Ryan. I'm doing the Ryan Young method. Uh, like, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna learn a new trick from Ryan. <laughs> breed some, some <laughs> fur. But I'll be damned if it's not working. Like, son of a bitch, I did what he said, and they're locking up. I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> all right. Like, like, I can't be that stubborn and just stuck in my ways because what I do works usually works for most things. It's like, if it's not working, I mean, I've got a few yeah. snakes that, you know, I'm like 10 years of trying to breed that haven't bred yet. 
Mm. And now they're getting old and they're absolutely irreplaceable. I would never be able to get more. They just don't exist. So I need to get them to produce. So I'm trying the Ryan technique uh, with food cycling to induce ovulation with some of these guys. And so far, we'll see. Like, cool. Like, their nice. females quit feeding. I'm like, really? Like, I never feed during the breeding season. So I don't know if they would eat at all. I'm like, I just don't ever offer them food. <laughs> like, never. Right. I'm like, so the refusing food, like, I, I don't even, I refuse to feed them. So I, then <laughs> I don't give them that option. <laughs> I kept feeding they this year. I kept eating. And they're like, the other day, all of them just like, nope, we're not eating. I'm like, really? <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll adopt a new technique for some of these things. Cool. Nice. Um, yeah. The last thing before we go, podcast. Uh, a couple of people are asking about that, so ah, it's coming out soon. It is. Uh, just bear with me. Uh, just to be to err on the side of too much information, I guess, since I can never shut up about anything. Um, years ago, I did a podcast, and that was great. I had a lot of good episodes, in my opinion. It was fun to do, but I always struggled at the time in finding guests because my goal is always to sort of have different sorts of guests and talk about things that other people don't talk about on podcasts, so sort of kind of carve out uh, a different little niche in the uh, podcast universe. Uh, definitely airing more on technical scientific matters and aspects of herpetoculture and that sort of stuff. But unfortunately, those sorts of guests are much more difficult to get. Academics generally don't care about being on some reptile dinglings podcast. A lot of times they don't. Some will. But it's so it's hard to get like if you do a podcast where you're talking to snake breeders and keepers, like those people are usually really willing to come on and talk. So you don't, you have a, a ready supply of, of guests. If you want to talk to the PhD crowd, it's a much smaller group of people. And a lot of them are just not interested in doing that. So mm -hmm. I struggle getting guests on a regular basis. So what I'm doing now is recording multiple episodes in advance before the first one goes out. So I have a kind of a cache of episodes to buy myself a little time when it inevitably takes, you know, longer. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I might like in the next two weeks, I probably should have enough episodes to go live and I'll have by that. I'll have eight or nine of them already done. Um, okay. I'm trying to get one with a, the guy's actually a friend of mine. He's just finished his PhD and it's like, it, he's got the crunch time to finish that, but I want to talk to him about his results, but it's very technical. It's all about the, you know, molecular evolution of sex chromosomes and dwarf monitors, which is, that's some nerdy stuff right there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. But he had to get, things had to get published. So you're waiting for that. You're always waiting for something when you're talking to academics a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple, three more academic guests. I should be able to knock them out in the next couple of weeks and then hopefully get some, yeah, closer to the end of the month and then <laughs> be able to put things out on a regular basis, hopefully. This and it will make seven six or seven people super happy. This, uh, this is apparently some sort of um, blackmail that's going on. Is that Lucas wants roughies, or he's deleting the files? So he says, I actually, I only have female roughies. Lucas. Oh, I need female uh, roughies. So send I them there. I'll tell you. Females yeah. this year. <laughs> you need a female roughie? No, not yet. Uh, I don't know. These these three are annoying me. Maybe maybe I can always need more roughies. Uh. You haven't bred them yet. Did you breed them yet? No. Well, I got the clutch, but they all died on me. So um, this year, hopefully, I've been seeing locks. So yeah, you probably they're not that hard to breed. The babies are kind of a pain to get feeding. I find really really, <laughs> they're yeah. yeah, they're substantially more difficult than a carpet. Usually, what wins the day is patience, and you just kind of wait them out, and eventually <laughs> they eat. But it's like months and months go by. I still got one that's never fed from last year. Never eat. It's never eaten. God. I'm not even surprised it's never eaten. I'm not Holy even surprised shit. at all. Like it's, uh, yeah. So they can wow. be challenging. That'll be next. That'll be this year's pain in my ass. So yeah, it's cool when you breed. It's like holy crap. That's like one of the rarest pythons in the world, and like you just hatched them. It's pretty <laughs> neat. Yeah, yeah. And they're such a cool species too. Eric, you must have Carinata. Yeah, I got one from you, and you? I, I need okay. actually I need a female. <clears throat> I have a See? male. Yeah, <laughs> at the <laughs> box. The that. box is building. We're building a box here. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, the Nick like, box. <laughs> I, hatched, I only had like six from a, a female I held back. She's not that big, and I got like six babies, and they're all girls. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, there was a seventh one that hatched, but it was a male, and it had his. You ever had it? Had something that had its hennepines out? No. 
Just no. like hemi yeah. peens completely averted, just dragging his hemi peens around until they fell off. You couldn't put him back in. It was like some sort of weird birds effect. I've uh, seen it before in boas and other things. Not common, but occasionally you'll see them and they're they're just junk is out. And of course, that doesn't go well. No. Uh, Eddie, you know, he never ate and crashed very soon. Something was not right. And <laughs> obviously he was not 100 percent Yeah. No, and he, he didn't uh he didn't last terribly long. The other six were solid and they're all girls, though. Mm. So which is better than all boys. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right. right, so we'll, we'll end here. We'll chop over to the, uh, the Patreon thing's not going to be live. We'll post it up tomorrow, um, or tonight after we're done, but we're going to talk about, uh, something over there and for about 10, 15 minutes or so. And then Nick has to roll. So <laughs> 10, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, Go ahead, throw your info out there. I mean, I'm sure everybody sure. knows where it is, but in case we got people listening to it that don't know, where can they find you, Nick? Uh, I'm the easiest guy in the world to find. Just uh, inlandreptile.com. I'm on Facebook. I think theoretically I'm on Instagram, but I never check that uh, <laughs> because I'm old and I don't even know. You're I'm old. Like, you ain't on Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> no. There's so many of these things now. Like my kids are like, "Oh, what's what are you doing?" It's like, "Oh, I'm on Snapchat." I'm like, "What's a Snapchat?" I don't know. Like, like what? I don't even. I'm like, oh, I'm too old. Nick. It must be like, I think I'm just probably a little bit too old for even Instagram because I don't even understand why Instagram even exists. Like, why do we need this? It's like a place where you can post pictures and say stuff. Like, aren't there a bunch of places like that? Like, I don't. Yeah, but this is a different one. What? Why, why? I don't understand. I don't. I don't want to be on Twitter. I don't want to be on any of these things. I just. Uh, I'm yeah, like Twitter's I'm on, us. I'm on Facebook with the rest of the old people. <laughs> oh, Gen Xers and above. We're all over there. Yeah, no worries. You're 50, yet, Eric. Uh, no, I'm 48. I'll be 49 oh. in. Uh, Oh, yeah. here's the young bucks. In still. March. 48 sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm would love it. I, I, I have fond <laughs> memories of being 48 a couple years ago. I just turned 50. It sucks. I got I got oh, three shit. more years till I hit 40. You can kind of like almost delude yourself into thinking you're not an old man when you're in your late 40s, but when you hit 50, there is no denying it. You are fucking old. So old. I'm 50 in my mind now. <laughs> I, 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 to the puppy. Gym the other day. I was at the gym the other day and like this, you know, kind of cute young girls there. And I try to not pay any attention to that at all. I'm there to do something and I don't want to be, I'm not definitely like creepy old dude. <laughs> And so I'm like actively avoiding making eye contact and this girl's working out next to me. And then she like starts talking to me and like trying to get my attention. And I'm like, well, that's really weird. So I, you know, uh, take my headphones down and everything. And like, what does this girl want? And then she literally turns out she thought I was her friend's dad. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh. Uh, like, just kind of like, oh, I thought you were my friend's dad. Like, oh, like, oh, yeah, oh, that, that oh, makes God, sense, right? Like, yeah, that makes uh, sense. Like, the messed up thing is in your mind, you still think you're 20, right? I, I still think of myself I as young, but I'm, maybe I don't know. But yeah. it's like, yeah, no, I thought you were my friend's elderly father, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, it's just uh, like this total. For like a second, it was like this crushing ego deflation, and then I just cracked up. I just thought that was the funniest thing. <laughs> oh man, that's great! Just, All right, old guy. Well, now. And we'll jump over into the other. Yeah. Thing. On that note, let's All jump right. over the. On that, All right. note, we'll jump over to the Patreon. <laughs> <laughs>